Welcome to the Great Base Tennis Podcast. I'm Steve Smith along with Ethan Matthews. Give me the big fist pump. Six foot five. And counting. Six foot five. My ego is six foot seven, so we get along really well. Ethan from Idaho, he's a member of the Winter Green Tennis Staff, tennis teaching professional. And he has a truck with a big G on it for Green Bay. What we're trying to do to this podcast is we're going to talk about coaching. We're going to go back to American legend. But let's start with uh, growing up in Idaho. How did you become such a Green Bay Packers fan? And actually for our listeners first is we do have some people that don't live in the U.S. of A. that listen. Mm -hmm. um, American football. Tell us about how you became a Green Bay Packers fan. It is, uh, yeah, living out in Idaho, it's just kind of a world away from Wisconsin, right? And uh, one of my best friends growing up, he, his dad had like a huge man cave and it was just all Green Bay Packers stuff. So as soon as you went in there, there was, you know, you got Vince Lombardi, you got Bar Brett Favre, Bart Starr, Ray Nitschke pictures all over the place. So it's hard to not kind of get enamored. Um, and then when I found out that the NFL, or excuse me, only the Packers are a fan owned franchise, I kind of, kind of signed me up, you know, cause I could be an owner without being an owner. <laughs> no, it's small town. Small town, man. Uh, with uh, cheese heads. For me, I grew up in a small town, Potsdam, New York, and the biggest thing in town was Clarkson Hockey, and they were the green and gold. But back when I was a kid, there's only three TV stations, and you were definitely gonna see the Packers because the teams that were winning were on TV. Where now you have so many choices, so, so many yeah. games that you can watch. Uh, one of the greatest coaches of all time, uh, certainly in all of sport. And I think with uh, the book that you brought today with When Pride Still Mattered, that was written in 1999. A lot of books written on Lombardi. Mm -hmm. I have 24 pages of notes here, mostly on Lombardi. Uh, I don't think we'll get to the 24 pages of notes. Let's just start with a quote. Why don't you uh, just call out a number? One through 50. 14. It's easy to have faith in yourself and have discipline when you're a winner, when you're number one. What you've got to have is faith and discipline when you're not a winner. Uh, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Uh, the dictionary is the only place that success comes before work. With um, Back in the 80s, when I was training tennis teachers, like it was a formal education, they had a degree. One of the, one of the segments is we we studied coaches, but you had to you had to study Lombardi with um, football gridiron. Look at the field; it's a metal grate with parallel bars used to cook hot dogs and hamburgers. That's where that term gridiron comes from. The sport requires man to measure like a grid and be made of iron. Qu quickly, American football. Um, and listeners, hang in there because this is all going to be geared towards tennis. I think of uh, Novak Djokovic and Goran Ivanisevic with Nikki Pilic and talking about how hard they worked. Mm -hmm. um, then Goran came first, obviously, and how hard they worked with Nikki Pilic or someone, one of our pillars, Harry Hopman. Um, I think some of that's gone away. First game, Princeton Rutgers, uh, November 6, 1869. It used to be a, a round ball, oblong. It was a combination of soccer and rugby. It went from the scrum to the snap, went from 25 players to 15 to 11. At one time, football was called mob soccer. Um, with talk a little bit about today, um, you know, 25. Um, players on the field, but talk to us about seven man football. Yeah. Seven man football is, is something that's kind of changing the game at kind of the lower level, like high schools can't some high schools, like what small town that you, you and I were from, they can't field an entire 11 on 11 team. So they'll put a seven V seven team out there and still be able to play other schools within that district, within that state. And so it gives kids is still an opportunity to still be athletic and play the game. So uh, just one name that comes to mind is, is Leighton Vanderesh, uh, hometown hero of ours, because he, he came out of Idaho. He went to Boise State, big college of ours. 
but he really went and did seven man football in high school. And he kind of attributes that to why he was so athletic and able to kind of go sideline to sideline when it came to playing football on, on 11 on 11. And now high schools, um, I mean, seven, seven man football, it's usually played in the spring, correct? True. Yeah. And yes. with, with, with teams that are on 11 man squads, but I'm shocked that even the town that I'm from, uh, well, hot Potsdam, New York is a hockey town that I been family when I was 10 moved to Kazan, New York, which at that time was a football town, Sam Volo, the coach. Um, but also because of the equipment. Mm. Cause it's so expensive to buy helmets and yeah. such, uh, for tennis parents uh, years ago, I've not days, but decades coaching this game is, uh, I was working with, uh, family the father played football at Colgate and he used to always take a football to, this is back in the eighties, took a football to practice or excuse me, to tournaments and said, you know, a lot of, a lot of kids is getting bored where they can't catch a football, throw a football. Yeah. yeah. Seriously though. You know, it's, um, Walter Camp considered the father of American football, like our Sir Walter Clapton Wingfield in tennis, 1873. But in 1880, the football rules came more into play. Uh, I'm going through these notes fast, but mm -hmm. some of the rules, uh, and I do think you could talk about how, how you can learn so much about offense, defense, all sports by watching football. Um, snap the four downs the yeah. 10 yards yeah. and then the, the huddle exactly. when you comment a little bit on the rules yeah yeah so i mean th when you look at tennis from a perspective of tactics it becomes a really beautiful game right when you just look at football for what it is it probably doesn't look that appealing to the most eye but when you start looking at it from the offensive and defensive tactic part of it you start understanding why certain plays are called in certain situations just like you would have to do while you're on the tennis court, right? Like, why would I put a drop shot here when a better volley would be kind of the way to go? So just looking at the tactics wise of that, it's very, <laughs> it's a lot more X's and O's is what they call it, right? Than what it seems on paper. So that's why, you know, studying of the film is so important when it comes to football. They have to, every week they go back and they, they continue to look at film study the other team, study what they have done correctly or vice versa, incorrectly, like so many things have happened. So, Yeah, I think with uh, American football, it's cerebral. It's 11 on 11, 22 people. And you listen to the commentators, certainly unlike singles in tennis where there's only two people on the court, you know, where did the 11 on the offensive unit go? Where did the 11 on the defense, mm -hmm. the, the attack, the counterattack? Um, but I think the timeouts, I, when I say timeouts, I mean, in tennis, we have, it used to be 30 seconds, now it's 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. But from one snap to the next, when they, they get into the huddle, I'm always telling the, the tennis kids, it's like you're the quarterback. Mm -hmm. I think everyone should be trained trained like a quarterback, but they have to go into huddle with themselves. They post-plan, they pre-plan. You're right. With going back to back in the old days, um, a home team would, You'd show up and the home team say these are the rules for the day and when you travel as a visiting team it's like okay and even the scoring system but the arguments were rampant at one time in football um you didn't have the have to go 10 yards and four downs right uh, i have some notes even on canadian football where they they go three downs and it said it really turned into a wrestling match because they you just didn't want to fumble and then they uh, won the people that were in favor more of the soccer style they didn't mm -hmm. they didn't want throwing to come into exactly. the game yeah um and it reminded me of the movie hoosiers um where they didn't have a 24 second clock in basketball the shot clock yeah the shot clock and coming back to the lombardi he coached basketball he had never played basketball went to the library read many books but one book became his bible and he coached a high school state championship that movie hoosiers you can look at it on youtube the score was uh, 32 to 30. Uh, so people would, you know, take the basketball out of basketball. In other words, you just would dribble and and it'd be very, very careful with any type of Absolutely pass. Absolutely, right. With um, Canadian football. We talked a little bit about that just quickly. Um, McGill and Harvard had a game. 
home and away, Montreal and Boston, and the the Harvard rules favored soccer more, more influenced by soccer, and the Canadian group was influenced more by rugby. And then the participants, whether it was fans, coaches, players who actually had a voice in that, that really wasn't detailed, but uh, the Canadians will, there's actually a football commercial, a Super, Super Bowl commercial where the Canadians claim that they, they they're they the founders them. of American football because what happened with that home and away confrontation or function event that the Canadian inf uh, influence was there uh, was was what what they chose so it became more like rugby uh, Canadian football uh, the field's bigger it's longer it's wider the field goals are a different place only three downs there's no fair catch That's imagine crazy. that crazy yeah, no um, you, there's many many people who've played Canadian football who didn't quite cut it to play in the National Football League um, Warren Moon, Joe Cap, but I remember Doug Flutie played at Boston College. Joe Theismann actually went to Notre Dame. It was Theismann? They changed his name to <laughs> Theismann for Heisman, but they ran back punts. They were quarterbacks that ran back punts. A um, different breed, different time, huh? Yeah. With, give me another number on a Lombardi quote. Ooh, let's go. Lucky number twenty-three. Obstacles are what you see when you take your eyes off the goal. So true. With, I made a mistake one time. I was at a hockey school in Canada and the counselors, the off-court supervisors were Canadian football players. And I, you know, I was there probably when I was 11, but 12, 13, 14. And my mouth got me in a little trouble. I said, Canadians, you guys don't play football. And, uh, the uh, I can remember um, starting a food fight. Probably the best thing was is I uh, um, these Canadian football players. I was in a dorm. Uh, all of us were there were barracks. They were curling ranks with bunk beds. And at that time, Bobby Hall was the uh, one of the most famous players in the world. And I was stupid enough to think I wouldn't get caught. And I yelled out, "Bobby Hall's in the lobby." <laughs> So if there's 120 kids in the camp, 119 ran up to the lobby to get an autograph. And they made me, in my underwear, walk around the hockey rink barefoot, carrying a fire extinguisher above my, my shoulders. I, must, I probably weighed 82 pounds. But yeah, the Canadian football players, they didn't like my, uh, my comment. With uh, football and TV, um, here's some interesting thoughts, Ethan. The invention of television, 1926, 1938, it was commercially available. Certainly development distribution was so slow then. Just think how fast these uh, big flat screen TVs hit everybody's house. Exactly. The, so fast. The old TV is like, boom. And then there was World War II. But in 1948, there was only 8,000 homes that had TV, 8,000 plus. By 1960, we had 45 million. I remember there's a big thing about Nixon Kennedy where there was the first presidential debate that was on TV. Right, right. But in 1958, Baltimore Colts played the New York Giants on TV, captured the American public. I would have been four years old. Game went overtime, labeled best game ever. And from that point forth, it was as if football, like in hockey in, in Canada's religion, is that it became just... I mean, it certainly is, you could tell me your opinion, it's certainly uh, number one over baseball now. Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, it yeah is this the, is definitely sport. America's sport, I think now. Yeah. So football became religion. I hope that doesn't offend anyone, but that's just like, it's <laughs> just to tell, it's just a way to say how important it really is. Well, you know, Lombardi is one of my favorite quotes from Lombardi. You know, he always says there's three things in life and it's God, family, and the Green Bay Packers in that order, so... Yeah, tell us about, you know, back in the 60s um, when he was asked about black players, white players. Yeah, yeah, I, I just could sum it up in one beautiful quote. He said, I don't, I don't have any black players. I don't have any white players. I just have green players. And it just, it speaks volumes, right? Because we're all just the green and gold out there when we put it on. And he would, uh, 
trade players if they had any problem with equality. Yes, yes. He, he, there was a famous story about um, Lombardi. Well, people would say, well, he couldn't coach today. One of his players, Fuzzy Thurston, was there th through the championships, but um, I believe it was Lombardi's last year. And by the way, I mean, this book, there's so many books on Lombardi. Um, I just had some time where I just... I mean, you can just study Lombardi. That's what YouTube oh, is yeah. just amazing. But Fuzzy Fur Thurston had to talk to Lombardi about his contract, and he was in, in Lombardi's office. And he brought an agent, and Lombardi excused himself, went down the hall, made a phone call, came back and said, uh, Fuzzy, I don't need to talk to you today. He said, why is that? He goes, I just traded you to Cleveland. <laughs> I talk to players. I don't talk to ag agents. <laughs> so, uh, well, I know that you're a fan. You got that big G on the back of your truck. Um, I think you do have to paint the truck though. The truck should be green. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little tough because with the G and the truck being red as it is, I, it gets mistaken for a Georgia Bulldog G. So I've got to, especially in this part of the country, right? especially, yeah, yeah. More down South here. You're in Virginia with, um, Green Bay. Tell us about, um, your mom season tickets. Yeah. So it's. Since 1965, I believe it is, the Green Bay Packers have sold out every home game that they've had, which is an all-time top record for sure. Um, and there's such a waiting list for the season tickets because once you get season tickets, you pretty much just hand them down throughout your family, right? It's just such a commodity. So when I was about eight years old for a Christmas present, my mom gifted me a little certificate that says I was on the wait list for season tickets and I wasn't eligible until I would be 64. So just all that time, I'm, I was still just keep saving up for it. So when I'm 64, <laughs> wow. I can get my season tickets. Yeah. Well, we're talking football. We're going to circle it, tie it into tennis, but um, I know for myself to speak on football, people must say, what is he doing? But I have a, uh, something here that states something about my football background. I wrote this letter on December 3rd, 1986. It's on Tyler Junior College Stationery. It's addressed to uh, Mr. DeLoss Dodds. He was the athletic director at Texas. I had read where they had an $8 million budget for, foot, for sports. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what it is now. Texas is Ohio State. They're right up there. One, Huge. two yep. uh, biggest budgets for sports in American uh, in the U S of a. So, um, yeah, I'll read this letter it encloses a copy of my resume. I would appreciate it very much. If you'd consider my resume as an application for the open position as a head football coach at the university of Texas. It's only two paragraphs, even though my only experience in football was over 20 years ago as a pop Warner player, I feel I would be able to add to the successful tradition of football at the university of Texas. Granted, I would, need the support and consultation of experts. However, I would be able to motivate, organize, and work around the clock to satisfy the fighting and winning spirit of the students, faculty, and alumni of the University of Texas. Wow. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Compelling. So in writing that, people have to understand what Pop Warner football is. That means um, you have to weigh between 80 and 120 pounds. First year, I didn't get a uniform because I didn't weigh 80 pounds. <laughs> But uh, with it, um, I was training uh, st students uh, seeking occupational competency in the field of tennis teaching, pro management, and get the cover letter out. Don't be afraid of rejection. And so this is, this is laminated, and I've got the letter to the left and letter to the right, and I was so pumped on December 12th, 1986, from uh, Mr. Dodds. Your application for the head football coach at the University of Texas has been forwarded to me. We have selected David McWilliams as our head football coach. Thank your application and your interest at the University of Texas. Best of luck in 1987. <laughs> so rejection. You mind if I look at that? Yeah. Wow. With, with, uh, as you're looking at that, I'll tell a Pop Warner story with, um, I have a brother, pretty sure, have to double check that life's unfair. I used to pray to not be a little runt. And 
um, he never got to play because he weighed too much. Oh. So, um, but with Pop Warner football, I remember they yelled out, who wants to be a, in the backfield? Who wants to be a line lineman? I said, well, everybody wants to be in the backfield. So I went with, with a line. And um, I was a end going both ways. So I'll tell you, the offensive story is I – all known in the end zone, delayed pass, drop a ball, hit me right in the bad spot, right in the hands. Ooh. And uh, this is, doesn't happen, I don't think, today, as they put a sticker on my helmet, couldn't catch cold. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's an eternal scar. So that story's uh, going on 60 years old. But I was um, defensive end. My job was to turn the play into the linebacker, but I was chasing the quarterback. And I remember Bill Christensen saying, Smith, you're never going to catch that kid. And um, but he also told me, I'm pretty sure, Smith, that you're the dumbest kid in the world. <laughs> and, uh, Football coach is real tough on you. Out there. Back, back in those days, the parents would just be clapping. Yeah, that's right. Let him right. know. Let him know. He's got to be smarter. So I was supposed to just turn the play in. And there was a kid named Timmy Zerbel who was tougher than tough. He was like the, the Ray Nitschke. He mentioned right. a Green Bay Packer linebacker. But uh, the play would go to the outside. So that following Monday, he had every kid line up and it seemed like there was, you know, not like a football squad of 95, but just mm -hmm. kid after kid. And each went three times. And on defense, you use your hands to push them to the outside and have the play turn inside. Right. But those experiences, uh, I, I think that's why it, it, it's so important for kids to play multiple sports. Very, very. Yeah, a multi-sport athlete today goes so much further in athletics than, than what just a singular sport athlete does from just an early age. With, um, for our listeners, I mean, my, my thought is, I think you can talk about concussions, is um, every little boy in the US of A should play football. Um, there's three types of sports, um, non-contact, which is tennis, yep. contact, you know, say soccer, I mean, it's tough. You can take the elbow, but football is collision. Very. My father used to say it's like two mountain goats lining up. <laughs> Contact's going to happen, huh? And with this uh, small town I was in, uh, Cliff, Don Cliff. I mean, I could just imitate him like I could imitate my father. Yeah. <laughs> and just would, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think for young kids, I think for older kids, I what do you talk about the safety of the game and rules? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, when you look at football and how so physical it is, like the biggest thing nowadays is, oh, the kids are going to get hurt. And, and, and they are. They, there is going to be a little bit of hurt. But, you know, Lombardi says hurt is only in your mind, not in your body. Um, so you can kind of you have to learn how to compartmentalize some pain to some degree and still learn how to keep pushing forward. Um, but even at the young age, they're doing a lot of great stuff. You know, we talked about the seven on seven. They're doing a lot of that with also more flag football oriented as well. Really not doing any kind of contact, at least until, you know, 11 or 12 when the brain's a little bit more fully developed. And um, but even by that age, I mean, I was learning life lessons, you know, at 10 on the practice football field with my with my buddies and and the coaches yelling at us just like yours were as well. So, no, I can I don't, I don't think kids, my, my mother used to say, she'd drive through a neighborhood and would say, the kids must be inside playing with the butler <laughs> because you don't see pickup sports. It's, it's, it's actually in many ways too structured. Right. With, um, but football is cerebral. I mean, when I think people who don't really know it say, oh, it's such a barbaric game. Um, you just think of the study that goes into it with, um, I think we can come back and talk a little bit about film, but right. with um, the way play, way football players train, one of our pillars is Mr. Hopman. He used to do kangaroos. And then, um, you know, so Mr. Hopman was older than uh, Coach Verdick, who's one of our pillars. And Coach Verdick was like Mr. Hopman into the kangaroos. <laughs> with um, Lombardi, he just had people hit it. You know, you're running in place and you look at this all on YouTube and the, 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 
the players with equipment, without equipment, they just throw themselves on the ground, you know, forwards, backwards, sideways, and they just have to jump back up. Um, one of the most grueling drills you can do with a young kid on a tennis court is say, all right, everybody sit down. So you now get up. And when they get up, they use both hands. Right. Say, okay, now just use one hand. And they get up and they sit back down and say, all right, now you can't use your hands, but you can cross your legs. Say, okay. And then now sit down and you can get up. You can't use your, you know, can't use your arms. You can't cross your legs. You can rock a little bit and just jump up. And then you find out how strong your core is with, uh, mm -hmm. We have told our listeners to go back to, on YouTube and look at uh, JFK, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, um, the P test that they used to uh, give. And the one uh, to pass at the highest level, a high school senior, you have to carry somebody for a mile that's within uh, 10 pounds of your weight, up, up 10, down 10. So you and I wouldn't have been partners. Oh, come on. You know, even though you're six five and I'm six six, uh, you know, so the, the, you know, I'd be a little guy. That Your ego was weigh, would weigh you down, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> With, um, but I, I think that, you know, I, I tease and I, you know, say, you know, uh, when you put a helmet on, that means something bad could help, that could happen. Yes. And you know, just to envision some young boys here in the U.S. of A. Could you play in tennis? Could you picture them with a helmet on? And um, when kids used to play the football in the side yard, it wasn't touch. Little kids, they wanted to play like the pros. Exactly. No pads, and it'd be tackled. Exactly. And that's where the little kids, they really didn't get hurt. Now, big kids, different ball game. Yes, yeah. Like what's going on with the pros. and um, Well, it is such a reckless game, right? I think you, you put your body on the line so much, and... And yeah, everybody wants to be what they see on TV. So they're, I, and we've had it a lot when I was in second and third grade where people would just seem like we're Lawrence Taylor out there just trying to be the ultimate linebacker and sacrifice their body just in, in between on lunch periods. So very, very tough game. Um, I had this down. This is not from my research, but um, in the late 1980s, I first went to the University of Illinois to train the women's tennis team, Labor Day camps, did it for several years. And you know, I was just asked, the, the, uh, the coach at that time had worked for me, and I was brought in to set the tone for the, the season. And what I would do is take the girls to the field and say, and my goal was that their warm-ups you know, the grass is wet to do, and they're going to, mud would be great. But right. Maybe it wasn't rain or whatever. But their warm ups were going to be grass stained because they, they were just running plays up, knees way up, knees way up, and I'll hit it. And uh, that's just some of those things have just gone away um, as far as Lombardi and football training. You know, I think that also to kids homeschooling in tennis now, they're, they, they're, it's not like they're behind the high school after school watching how football teams practice. Oh, exactly. They just go to the games. Yeah, yeah. They just see what they put on Friday nights, Saturday nights. Uh, I follow up with questions I ask. I've had so many kids over the years, uh, not just the sons, but the daughters, they say, hey, um, August, double sessions. You know, go back to the high school and watch the teams practice. It's, I think, everywhere in the summer. Oh, yeah. Maybe, ruthless. Maybe, ruthless, too, it is. Maybe not up here in the mountains of Wintergreen, but I think everywhere <laughs> in the summer, uh, we're 3,000 plus feet up, and it's really, really hot. Um, tell us a little bit about how they, they don't do that in August anymore. That's, no, no. That's that's one of the biggest things like about player safety. Unfortunately, a player passed away. Um, I think it was at Maryland during one of those two-a-day practices. So... And during that off season, they really kind of revamped, you know, how they practice, when they practice too. You know, if it's over a certain amount of temperature, they're not going to practice. They also have now implemented hydration breaks as well. Um, that's gone out through a lot of sports. I think hydration breaks. I've seen a, a lot in soccer um, as well. So, yeah, it's it's starting to ch it's changed a lot, especially with the practice. But it is still very contact of a sport so you got to get that in at some point well i'm 40 years older than you i can remember that um if you ask for water i, I tell tennis kids today 
uh, don't be the first one to ask for water. You know, you don't want right. to deny, you don't want to deny a kid of water. You know, the other thing is, uh, as soon as, soon as you say ball pickup, someone goes, oh, I got to go to the bathroom. No, 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 no. You don't have to go to the bathroom. I'm pretty sure you just don't want to pick up balls. Exactly. Uh, but if they got to go, they got to go. Um, I know I remember uh, a man telling me that when he was younger, he remembers he, he was hoping to get tackled so he could lick the dew off the grass because it was a character builder. Then also too, is, you know, some kids showing up, I had a, a, a young man, nice, nice family. He would always bring in extra coconut water. I have to say, I don't really like coconut water, but the kid would bring me a coach. I brought a coconut water for you. Wasn't that really nice? But we had to drink. It was like a soup ladle out of everybody drink out of the same bucket. You know, then it progressed mm -hmm. where, well, sanitation would be a little bit better. Now we'll use a hose. Yeah. And then it progressed to where, oh, we'll put a PVC pipe on the end of that hose and just poke holes in it. So it, yeah. And then we can feed all of them at the same time. Yeah. So we're not against water, but this the thing with, uh, you know, I tell kids all the time, if first thing on the tennis court, they're sipping Gatorade just for the taste. Junior tennis players don't realize that, you know, their aspirations to play D1, 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 Division One tennis or above, that um, the trainers are educated and they just know, oh, it's just a kid drinking for the sugar. Here, here's something. Frank Sinatra, the singer, he said, I'm a singer. Elvis is a culture. Elvis Presley. Uh, you're part of the football culture. You, so you're a fan. Tell us, how's Green Bay doing right now? Uh, yeah, it, well, it, it looks at how, it depends on how you look at it. I feel like there was expectations are pretty low this year going into, you know, losing Aaron Rodgers in the off season. Um, but I think as far as we are now, I think we're doing pretty all right. We're two and two as the record go, we're sitting second place in the division. Um, so it's just, it's going to be a long season, but it looks like each week we're, we're progressing in a little bit different way. We're finding new ways to win. Like I think it was two weeks ago when we, when we all played the Saints, and uh, I say we all when we played the Saints and and going into the fourth quarter we were down by seventeen, and we came back and ended up winning eighteen to seventeen. So that's the longest comeback in Packers history um, in any quarter. So um, that was pretty great to see them fight and and still be able to come back and and still pull off a victory. This last week against the Lions was a little bit tougher, um, just because it's a division rival and. You never like to lose to those guys. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, it's actually a really good season going on right now. So I'm actually looking forward to seeing what else we do as we keep going forward. Yeah. One of the things in listening to you talk about the Packers is the pronoun we. I mean, oh, you, it was all over there, wasn't it? <laughs> we, I love it. With fan is short for fanatical. I mean, there's, it's a whole different th deal where you're watching a game. And it doesn't matter to who wins. Yes. But if you're watching a game and you really want someone to win, um, as a kid, I was that way with uh, Clarks and hockey, but I was that way with the Green Bay Packers. With so my three older brothers in my football career, I was a runt and I was advised to run cross country going and not play football as a freshman. Good and bad advice looking back is, um, Cross country is a different experience, and my my yeah. my my sport was hockey, so it really isn't sport specific to do that long, slow distance running. But what a character builder! I mean, uh, it's I again, I don't want to sound negative, doom and gloom, but uh, every tennis kid says, "Hey, okay, let's go run ten miles," and they look at you cross eyed. Right? And they oh, that's bad for me. That would be bad for me. Uh, you know, how's that that's for expression? Uh, Whatever it doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But when I was a young kid, uh, there was, in all fairness to kids today, there's, there's no TV. I asked Welby Van Horn one time, how did you get so good at tennis? And he said, Steve, when I was a kid, there was no TV. Well, when I was a kid, there was three stations. Sometimes, you know, just turn it on, there'd be a test pattern. Right. There's no, no programming. But it was like, okay, where you just play outside. And I remember watching... You're just watching those two two sessions, those double sessions, going to football practices. And I did just the culture, the sound of tennis, the, the sound of football, I'm sorry, the whistle, the hitting, the coaches yelling. Oh, yes. The assignments. And yeah. it's just 
forget public embarrassment, you know, check your ego at the door. And, exactly. And, uh, I mean, I've just got down here, the command, the sound, the hit after hit, the imperatives, the motivation, weather was not a factor. There was high school football teams, all football teams start in August when it's so hot. And then in the, towards the end of the season, in most parts of the country, it's just so bitter cold. Right. Exactly. And it's not like baseball, um, where it's raining. I did ask you to look George Carlin up, right? I don't think so. The, the comedian, the gridiron. Oh, yeah, 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 no, yes, you did. Yeah, and I've got a little, I got it saved on my phone now, actually. Baseball, the listeners should look that up. Just George Carlin, C-A-R-L-I-N, the late George Carlin, and he talks about the differences between football and baseball. I actually have this somewhere in my notes. Um, with uh, Back in the U.S. of A, uh, in the 60s, the Ford Motor Company, they had this thing called punt, pass, and kick. And and granted, sports were not fair back in the 60s for girls, but um, it would, um, every kid was participating. You know, how far you could you throw the football? How far right. could you kick it? How far could you punt it? And back in those days, people would just kick straight on. There was no soccer Right, kick. with the toe. Yeah. A guy named Dempsey had the record at 63 yards for the New Orleans Saints. He had half a foot. He wore a metal shoe. It was like a sledgehammer coming mm -hmm. through. But where I grew up, uh, upstate New York in Ogdensburg, the Gogolak brothers, they were the first two. They, they were immigrants from Hungary, and they, they could kick soccer style. Uh, talk a little bit about film, football film. Yeah, yeah. Film is every Sunday you play your game, by Tuesday or even that Monday night, you will have film from your game as well as the other opponent's game for your next week broken down for you to watch whether they were negative plays or positive plays. You want to, you know, highlight the good stuff that you do, right? You know, see the good, but also realize that there is some bad things and that you can get better in that as well. So film is a really great proponent when it comes to football of just showing, you know, where you could get better and where also you can prepare and scheme for the next team coming up the next prior week. So it's very, it's a very underrated thing when it comes to, I think the tennis world as well. And you can, you can attest to that. Yeah. Film, film and more film. Paul Brown, my notes from the history of football, coach of the Browns, innovation to domination, won three championships. He introduced filming also charting as well. He later, and he's given credit for being the pioneer for the quarterback to have a radio in their helmet. Oh, yeah, uh, that's right. You know, the expression way ahead of his time. When I was a kid, Sam Volo, I asked him at a funeral years later, and I said, why, Coach, why were you so successful? And he said, I just love football. Great answer. I just love football. So by the time I'm in the seventh grade, you can check out of uh, – study hall if you have a high enough grade point average so on a monday i go watch the game on saturday then on monday i could watch you know he was um a pe teacher but during his pe class on monday football was his baby he would show during so he would show it every period he was teaching pe so i would go into during my lunch period i'd go to his pe class then i had my his pe class that I had study also he had, had his old sequence analyzer and you know you crank it forward crank it backwards and we just show plays over play after play and you know even I remember one time him showing the reaction of the referee so the referee definitely was for the other team because <laughs> the other team scores and the referee jumps up and down with it with a touchdown sign uh but that that to me uh made, made a major impact on my life um I think another thing about football, I think basketball is the same in the sense that there's a freshman team, there's a JV team, and there's a varsity team. And during during pande the pandemic, during the COVID time, um, parents had to move so their kid could go someplace and be on a team mm -hmm. because it's not not the individual sport that tennis is. Um, and you know, not too many freshmen make a varsity football team. No. No. Because of the size, right? Exactly. Yep. Underdeveloped and, and too maturity-wise as well. You know, when I was in Memphis, we worked for a group of us. Uh, I was there 21 months. Of, of 24 months, a group of us went out and helped Tennis Memphis, a nonprofit. And Al Wooten, he 
his daughter plays tennis and met him and he was a running back for Syracuse and you know, he did well. He was, um, you know, he, he went beyond playing at Syracuse and played in the NFL some, but he, when I was a kid, I went to Syracuse football games and again, it's a, a culture, but just understanding the game with, you know, the, so many things like a tennis kid watching how the court, they watch on TV, how the quarterback listens to the coach on the sideline, you know, oh, the, yeah. the eye contact. You know, we always talk about this, the backup quarterback, where does he stand? He stands right next to the head coach. He's got a headset on like we've got on right now right. and they've got a clipboard. Exactly. And, and, you know, it's amazing how many backup quarterbacks have become outstanding coaches. With um, Syracuse football, um, when I was a kid, uh, one of my friends, his father was a vice president, so we went to quite a few games. And with that, they had Larry Zonka, you know, who oh, yeah. liked the tank. I mean, I mean, it, I will still tell children, junior tennis players, look up Larry Zonka. You, under, you understand the fullback goes right up the middle because in tennis, so many people are just trying to, well, my, my opponent's in this corner, I'll hit to that corner. Run around them, yeah. Instead of going through them. Um, the evolution of the helmet is interesting. B before police officers, firemen, soldiers had helmets, football players were the first people to have helmets. <laughs> they played with no helmets. The first guy, Joseph M. Reeves, uh, they told him that he needed to get a helmet. It was either going to be instant insanity or death because he had so many concussions. Which says, tell me what you said about Brett Favre with the concussions. Yeah, yeah. I saw a recent interview with Brett Favre and he was kind of saying, you know, he was talking with a, a neuroscientist and the neuroscientist was asking him, you know, how many concussions do you think he had throughout his career? And he's like, ah, oh, you know, probably had like 10 or 15. Um, you know, it was a few that were diagnosed, but there was definitely some that were missed. And he was like, the neuroscientist said, well, how about thousands? And Brett Favre was like, thousands? What are you talking about? That, there's no way throughout my career I've had thousands. And he said, how about every time that you got up after a hit, Brett, was your ears ringing? And Brett looks, jeez, yeah, that's like every single play. Well, that's a, a certain form of that kind of concussion. And that was, that was done uh, a while back. So I think this, the helmets have changed quite a bit as well. You know, obviously from the leather caps that they had when you were playing where they had the leather in the front and the back. And it was uh, the the science behind that has gotten a lot more advanced, too. Thank God. Right. Because it is such a violent sport with documentaries. Um, Patrick Mahomes, uh, that was one of his role models, correct? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so people who don't know football, Patrick Mahomes uh, plays for the Kansas City Chiefs, played it. Texas Tech. Texas Tech, yeah. He's from East Texas, where I spent a lot of time in Tyler, Tyler, Texas. His father was a baseball player. And I heard Mahomes say, I play I play quarterback like a shortstop. And he, and he, he <laughs> yes. does. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting how he does. You know, and we don't do that anymore. I, we used to tell you know kids, okay, here are the half volleys, like a short hop for a shortstop. Right. You, know, you, you want to catch the ball as soon as possible, so you charge the ball and catch it on the hop. You don't let the ball come to you, just like if someone's on the baseline, their opponent hits short. Exactly. But we do this drill where you put a kid in the corner and I just, hit, they have no, t no tennis racket and I ground the ball out. I take my racket and I make the ball bounce several times from one corner of the baseline to the other corner of the baseline. We call it the Billie Jean King drill. Um, you know, she, she was a really good shortstop. Yes. And her brother, uh, Randy Muffet, he was a professional baseball player, pitcher for the San Francisco Giants. Uh, but with that, the documentaries, um, I watched one of the quarterbacks. Yeah, the one with Patrick Mahomes in that one. Yeah, I recently uh, watched John, Johnny Football. That one, that 30 for 30 was a, was a hot one. I like that one. And then uh, the one with uh, Urban Meyer, the, the Florida. The Florida Gators, the Swamp Kings. They could have done, I was, I was talking a little bit before, they, they could have done so much more with that documentary. But what they had put out there was just so incredible. Like, you know, that huge hit that, uh, that they had in that big bowl game. So it was, these documentaries really do show the real 
physical hard hitting side while also encapsulating the mental you know like on that hit he was talking about um how he didn't want to intercept the ball he totally could have gone for the ball but instead he wanted to send a message and you know sometimes you just kind of have to send that message in football with a really hard hit so that was accomplished <laughs> just from that in that documentary you, you kind of get to see how ruthless things can get out there one thing that did take place the timing of uh, the last dance, Michael Jordan. Oh yeah, phenomenal series. I mean, it's worth watching more than once. Very. And with that, um, you know, where do ideas come from? My opinion would be that influenced so many other documentaries because they showed so many highlights. Yes. And then, as you said, they took the highlights, like they're doing with uh, Swamp Swamp Kings. Yep. They just show the hitting and the sound, and it's like whoa. Um, I, I know a children, I'm always telling junior tennis players, do your homework first, but then I ask them, you know, your screen time, um, with, I was telling Yvonne Osteretz, who, uh, is the brains behind our podcast. He makes it happen. So, um, I was on the phone the other day with a junior tennis player who visited me twice and, um, I went through all the questions and I said, that really should be the podcast. Just listening to how I was talking to this kid. I said, all right, first time you didn't do it. You're the second time. Second time you came with your dad. Your dad's a teaching pro. Your dad played college tennis. We did video for both of you. I said, I told you not only to send me notes on your game, but notes on your father's game. I just went through the whole thing. Um, you know, nutrition, you know, but he, but he asked him to send it. I, I said, I, I said, one, when you go home, there's different ways to do it, but I need to know your percentage of body fat. Right. Send me an email. Send me an email every day on what you do. So I go all through all these questions. Um, at the end of my notes, I have down Ray Shonky. I had a chance to coach somebody who played for Lombardi, but he also played for this guy by the name of George Allen. And George Allen, you know, when I was a kid, I remember, um, if, you know, people would ask you your PE coaches and coaches would ask you your mile time before they'd ask you your last oh, name. Oh, Absolutely. And George Allen would say, what time did you get up today? What you have for breakfast? What you, what you do before you left the house? How many push-ups can you do? How many sit-ups can you do? And of course, every question he would ask. So I went through this whole thing with these kids, easily 50 questions. And I said, now, I said, as soon as you hang up, you know, send me notes. Now, he did a couple of things. I said, I said, have you done the beep test since you left? It's free. Get it online. I said, as soon as you hang up, uh, send a, a message to Yvonne and get the beep test. And I said, you can be running that every day. You know, we know what your score was and you want me to en endorse you, represent you for college placement. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to lie to a coach. Say, you know, this guy, he can let run two laps around the refrigerator and he needs to take a nap. <laughs> and, um, so anyway, he goes through it. So he, he, he does contact Yvonne. He does send me notes on the questions I asked him, but, and that was, um, not too good. At least he, at least he did it. Right, but, but a lot the, of kids don't. Right, but the but the the point I'm getting at is that this comes from Lombardi. This comes from football background. This comes from me. You know, the way I grew up in the '60s is that, um, you know, it's gone away. I mean, with you know, don't ever tennis coaches don't think of your student as a client. They're a student. They're a they're a student athlete, and talk to them like that. You know, keep our sport. Keep tennis a sport. Exactly. It's not a business. So. Anyway, um, with the next day, I get, I get an email and I took the morning off. Um, I played for an hour, hit for an hour and I ran a treadmill for 30 minutes. And I go, you don't really run on treadmills and let, you know, he is, you got to get in position to get in position. Mm -hmm. You know, any hills by your house, if I came to your house, how long, you know, how far is there a hill from your house? I mean, have you? When's the last time you're on the track? Right. Your heart rate, monitoring your heart rate, all those things. But I, I don't think that that's part of uh, the junior culture here in the U.S. of A. You no, know, talk, talking about uh, a Nikki Pilich, I think that would be great on TV if uh, you know, they were to ask a question to Goran. Goran, you and uh, Novak, you're working together, but you have this background. You both work for Nikki Pilich. What was that like? 
And I've heard Goran answer that question, but that question needs to be asked over and over again because we, you, we need to have um, the young people realize how hard people work. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, he goes, what, you know, I, I remember him saying water breaks. We had no water. There was no water breaks. So it, it just goes back in time. With uh, Lombardi, uh, Paul Harvey, you know, there's people my age that remember the famous newsman, broadcaster, radio, talk host. He said Lombardi was a civilian patent, General Patton. Oh, yeah. the, uh, here's a little bit more about Green Bay for you. In 1919, uh, it was the American Professional F Football Association. In 1920, it became the NFL. It was $500 a franchise. Green Bay was a team in 1919, but the meat packing company, that's where you guys became the Packers. Mm -hmm. The Indian packing company. The, um, the Giants, they were named after the skyscrapers. Um, I think this is important. I know that we made a go of it and I don't, uh, I know my performance wasn't very good when we talked about Rocky. Uh, the, uh, one of the reasons is that my notes were not in front of me. But Sylvester Stallone, this might be of interest to you. He's just a few years older than me. Um, in, a, in a way, Lombardi was Rocky. I mean, his father's a butcher. He only weighed 170 pounds. He played football at Hofstra and he became very strong. And one of the things was that carrying the, the just like Rocky, you know, the, the bloody, the sweaty, the, you know, carrying the uh, sides of beef. Um, Lombardi, devout Catholic, his whole life he went to church every day. But there's scenes in Rocky where he's being blessed. He's in the church. He's being blessed by the priests. Uh, discrimination against Italians. You know, back in the day, um, I didn't know this for the longest time. One of my brother's friends was called, they just called him Purr. And my father said, you know, asked me one time, why do they call him Purr? And I said, well, Whopper. And Purr is part of Whopper. My father was just shaking his head. And I, I didn't know for the longest time that what would meant without papers. Because uh, so many Italians entered the United States. And um, I think that's a problem now is entering the United States without papers. But the coaching style of Mick, his coach, um, lines like, you're a bum. Yes. For crying out loud. Uh, don't you have pride? It was the language of the time. And I think that's really gone away. But no doubt that Sylvester Stallone, uh, part of that story, part of Rocky, I mean, Lombardi was America, you know, Absolutely. at that time, yeah. um, his influence, he influenced anybody and everybody who was connected to sport. Um, Stall Stallone's a Catholic. You know, he, he went to a school called Notre Dame, Notre Dame Academy in New York. Um, with um, That little school, huh? Yeah, on YouTube, you can actually, listeners, you can plug in uh, Vince Lombardi fist fight. It's not really a fist fight, but they, at the end of the game, um, you know, the field's crowded, and some young kid, you know, maybe, maybe in his early 20s, it looks like he runs up, he takes Lombardi's hat. And of course, the kid's running away, but the field's crowded. Right. So Lombardi just turns and chases him down. It's, 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 like, it's like 45 seconds long. So yeah, I... What do they say? Go down the rabbit hole. I took a deep dive going back to, to Lombardi. Um, I'll just read this fast. Oldest son, father of a meat cutter. Uh, yeah, the sides of beef. Um, mother spiritual, religion is life. Mass 365 days. First wanted to be a priest and brought all those values. Um, went to Fordham, educated by the Jesuits. I love the Jesuits. When I think of the Jesuits, I always think of tennis teaching. Is just give us the first seven years. Usually the first seven years, some kids played with a palm up serve. Right. They've had, they haven't had fundamentals. Vince Lombardi, be brilliant with basics. You know, I have to say this, the great base. I, I talk to coaches I've trained all, all the time. And, you know, people say, are, are you, are you in the great base? Like it's fraternity. <laughs> and I think when someone says great base, you mean solid fundamentals. That's what we need to have. Everyone say when someone says, uh, are you part of the great base? You mean solid fundamentals? That's Vince Lombardi, be brilliant with basics. basics. Going back to his education, rigorous with academics, um, the Jesuits, they would just push people to um, perfection. He graduated with honors. 
his grandparents, he was third generation American. Um, he didn't think he was going to get a job because he was Italian. You know, he applied, he, um, he applied for many jobs, went to a school called St. Francis prep high school was a fullback parents, Harry and Matilda, he just raised, you know, a tough kid from Brooklyn. Um, I do think that when you think of tennis players that are um, like say second generation immigrants, you know, Agassi, Sampras, Jang, you just, you know, even like say on the other side of the ocean, uh, Federer, you know, Lynette Federer from South Africa or Federer's wife from Slovakia. Right. You know, people learning yeah. a new way, new language. Um, going fast on this, uh, Lombardi, number 40, offensive, defensive guard, tenacious. Could have been his middle name. Not that talented, not that fast, just tough. Five foot eight, undersized, Very, received a scholarship. Yeah. Injured his first three years, lost his, all of his lower front teeth, uh, wore a bridge the rest of his life. Um, he was a member of... In Fordham, they called him the member of the seven blocks of granite. Oh, yeah. That's a good, that's a good word. Gra Very. Granite. They need more metaphors like that in tennis, I feel like. With, um, no, you think about, I mean, like say a Jimmy Connors or in, in, in tennis or a Pete Rose. Yeah, it looks like they had the same haircut, but they just had the same mentality. Yep. And then what that mentality was, it's a football mentality. It is. It is. It's definitely it's just a football mentality. It's a kind of no pain, no gain type of mentality. With um, proud of the achievement to be a member of the seven seven blocks of granite. That a great. That is a great name. That's gorgeous. They were unbeaten to the final game against NYU. They lost seven six. If they'd won that, they would have gone to the Rose Bowl. You know, greatness comes from greatness. Uh, coach was uh, Jim Cowley at Fordham, and he was a uh, one of the four horsemen at Notre Dame. And uh, it's, it's just, you know, so, but Lombardi, he, he, from high school, he went to West Point. He worked coach at West Point for five years. You think back about like a Bobby Knight and you know, how they were influenced from the military. Yeah. The, uh, the regiment that they have. Yeah. You know, I, um, I, you know, I know we've had Chuck Greasy on as a guest and he loved to take his team to West Point. And I've had, you know, the Air Force, the Navy, the Army, even the Coast Guard has had players play at those schools. And they do things to, that's what, that was Lombardi, to, you know, break you down to build you up. You yeah. Know, they give, they give, give you a pair of scissors and say, well, go, go cut, go cut the grass. <laughs> and you go out on the, the football field or wherever, and you're using a pair of scissors to cut grass. Uh, some of that toughness, I know a mom who used to, anytime their kid would complain, and they lived um up north so they didn't I, I never asked her i said well what did you do in the winter time i always thought about that but when the weather was nice she would just give him a little plastic bag and they had to go out and pull weeds she'd just hear him complain one time fill this up <laughs> and it's like well do that or you don't eat I mean, it's just the, <laughs> the, 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 the discipline um his his um coach cowley was coached by the famous notre dame legend newt rockney um, so yeah, benefit by being around greatness, the stories of him being 170 pounds going up against people who weigh 240 pounds. Um, so that, you know, if, then if you see how, how he coached, uh, so many things, you know, how did Lombardi become Lombardi? He started as a high school teacher, Catholic school in Inglewood, New Jersey, St. Cecilia. He taught chemistry, physics, Latin, and phys ed. He was an academic handyman. Incredible. And now... He, the Green Bay Packers, he gave them grades every Thursday of these different categories. These guys are pro athletes. Oh, of course, man. Grown men, too. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, when he was with the Giants, there's, a, there's information on Frank Gifford that he had to learn how to talk to the pros. You know, so if someone goes from high school to college, college to pros, there's a great article that was in Sports Illustrated many years ago about Tom Brady, where, he's, where he goes, it was something like, you're always a rookie. You know, so you're you playing freshman football and you're mm -hmm. playing JV football and varsity football. And then you, you, you go, he, he went to Michigan and you're a, a red shirt mm -hmm. and you're a freshman all over again. Yep. And then you keep going. Then you go to the pros and you're a rookie all over again. 
<laughs> all it, over again. And it's, and it's just different levels. I mean, of course. actually that's where, um, you know, part of the five E's of player development is exposure. It's, uh, enjoyment in football. It's not hit and giggle. No, it's it, sport is not, it's, it's in, the enjoyment is, is the process. The enjoyment is the work. The enjoyment is the improvement. Then you go to education and that's where we really weak in tennis. And then it's experience and then it's going to be ex exposure. Then everybody obviously has got to be a safe environment. With back in Lombardi as a teacher, a good mix, he was patient, but intense. Um, at St. Cecilia's where he started his coaching career. His, hour, his practices were long and hard. Use the headlights at night to practice. He was there eight years, five years he was the head coach. He only had 300 students. They beat teams that had 10 times the enrollment. Um, always got the most out of his players. He coached his brother, who's 17 years younger at St. Cecilia. And there's, there's stories about how tough he was on his brother. Oh, yes. The, uh, I think that's something that uh, um, families are much smaller now. You know, the, what's this, the current generation is alpha. Yeah. The alpha generation. Yeah. And the, the most families right now in the U S are only having one child. And, um, I always tell people I'm from the family of six and my mother used to call me who's She'd call me Mike, Pat, Matt. She said, she just, I just smile. You know, I said, but so many things going on here. It had so many variables when you have that many children, you know, she's working outside of the house and this and that. So I'll call some kid by the wrong name. And I just look at him and go, you won't get the job. <laughs> if you're interviewed and someone calls you by the wrong name, don't correct the person who's, exactly. interview, who's interviewing you. So I think that that thick skin, you know, in, in football, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to replicate, if you will. I mean, I, I don't think there's a sport that, that gives you that tougher skin faster, you know, maybe a rugby type, right? Cause they're so similar in types, but it is tough like that. Well, I don't know much about rugby. I mean, I've watched it played and it, um, I mean, they have what seven men rugby and this and that, but mm -hmm. it's certainly no equipment. You hear, I spent a lot of time in Ireland and England and South Africa and, and, uh, not as much time in South Africa, but, um, you know, rugby, there's no, no helmets, there's no equipment. Yeah. No pads, you know, um, with, but that premeditated hit, um, you know, just lining up man, nose to nose. There's no avoiding the hit. Like Wayne Gretzky who played a lot of lacrosse. I mean, that's actually the national sport of Canada, the Iroquois Indians. Um, that's huge where I grew up is lacrosse. Uh, they used to play box lacrosse because hockey, they wouldn't have any ice in the summer. The Native Americans, that was their sport. But, you know, Gretzky brought this spinorama where he would spin off a check, but he, mm -hmm. he brought that from lacrosse. But in hockey, you can avoid the check. You can avoid the hit. Right. Uh, not 100%, but in football, there's no avoiding the hit. Yeah, it's coming. It's just like you said, those two goats lining up. It, well, yeah, you know? I mean, you will carry the ball, and this person will tackle you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's, oh, uh, boy. Uh, with, here's something from Lombardi. His, his team, uh, they were, one time they won in high school, 32, 32 and 0, unbeaten 32 games. During that time, they gave up three touchdowns and they, w they were 260 to 19 points. So, I mean, he was successful right from the get-go. Okay. Now, um, one thing he did is a little bit different. He would read letters to his high school players by critics. Supposedly, some were written by players on the opposing team. It came out later that Lombardi, he wrote the letters himself. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> he wrote the letters himself and he was just adding fuel to the fire. <laughs> like, how can we get these guys pumped up? Exactly. Um, to reinforce this, he, basketball, he never played basketball. He was assigned to coach basketball. He went to the library, read all these books. One book became his Bible and he won a high school state championship coaching basketball. Wow. With... Uh, Master psychologist, um, in one of his models, today was tough, tomorrow will be better. Another thing with Lombardi, coaching is teaching, teaching is coaching. He believed the classroom and the field required the same formula. It really does. I mean, you know, it really does. Um, 
you want to be successful academically, it's the same thing. You want to be successful mm -hmm. in tennis. Exactly. Married two kids, son and daughter, be became the assistant at Fordham. Then he went to West Point for five years. And when he got there, he said he was a neophyte. They, you know, and here's a guy who went, had a high school team that won 32 games in a row. I credit uh, Red, Earl Red Blake as his number one mentor. I do think that's something uh, we talked a little bit about, about Bill Walsh. Mm -hmm. uh, he, Lombardi was 20 years before he became a head coach. Bill Walsh was 17 years. You know, for people to pay their dues. Yeah. To, um, you know, I do think in, in the tennis teaching world here, especially in the U.S., is people climb the ladder way too fast. Oh, exactly. Is, is that to yeah. go someplace and serve a long apprenticeship. Yeah. Um, another, another great Lombardi quote on top of that to add is, uh, the man on top of the mountain didn't fall there. Say that again. The man on the top of the mountain didn't fall there. So yeah. just like that, you got to pay your dues. You got to get there. This is a good exercise. Uh, you can just print these out for your juniors. Rainy day. Uh, give me another number, one through 50. Well, let's go 42. It's a good number. 42. Um, if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying hard enough. Uh, the harder you work, the harder it is to surrender. Oh, I love that one. Uh, yeah, I know down in your office, you have all these quotes written up. Right. Mind vitamins, got to have them. Um, according to uh, Red Blake, and you got to apply all this all to tennis, is a, a, I should say according to Lombardi about Red Blake, it was a senior moment, Rob Blake's a hockey player. <laughs> Rob Blake, Red Blake. Get my wires going here the right way, connected. Uh, Blake's genius, according to Lombardi, was the organization of practice and the organization of thinking. Um, Red Blake, also film fanatic, details, 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 film by day, film by night. Um, first two year, years at Army, they lost one game. They did experience up and down because there was a, a, a problem with a cheating scandal where some of the cadets had made mistakes from a cheating standpoint. And because of that, they lost most of their starters. Yeah, yeah. And then they had to rebuild um, being so successful right away, they had to rebuild. And that's written, that was a very good le learning experience for Lombardi where they had to go with more inexperienced players. Next stop, New York Giants. You know, that was his dream team because he's from Brooklyn. Yep. Had to learn to adjust to the pros, not teaching kids anymore. Um, I know you're a football fanatic, so Tom Landry, the who went on and he was a coach in the famous ice bowl in 1967. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, not many people realize though, that the Lombardi trophy could have easily been named the Landry trophy, the Tom yeah. Landry trophy, because it was widespread that whoever won that ice bowl was going to go on and beat the chiefs in the first super bowl anyways. Yeah. So that it was either going to be the, the difference of the name. So thank goodness that the Packers got it. <laughs> Len Dawson. He was the coach of, um, uh, the chiefs. It's just amazing. Uh, how much information one can store in their head. The thing is that, you know, what are kids doing on their cell phone? And they, they need to become a student of sport. And you can learn so much by uh, understanding football. I remember uh, a dad one time saying to this young kid, said, well, I don't know much about football. And the father heard him say it and said, keep that a secret. <laughs> <laughs> With... Uh, um, so Tom Landry was the defensive coordinator. And um, if I have that right, Jim, Jim Lee Howell was the coach. They asked him. So you got Landry on defense, Lombardi on offense. Those are two assistant coaches. Mm -hmm. they, asked, they asked the head coach, what do you do? He goes, I just read the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> With uh, uh, Yeah, that's, that's got to be an all-time coaching room right there. You come in, offensive coordinators just doing all the work up. Defensive coordinators, same thing. Talk a little bit about Nick Saban and, uh, like, say, the coach at Clemson, the coach at Georgia, Systems. What comes to your mind? Yeah, yeah. That? So, I, you know, a, another tough nose kind of kind of coach as well with Nick Saban at Alabama where, you know, kind of see what you see is what you get. And, and his fiery passion is something you can really see on the sidelines and feel it, too, um, as a player. So, you know, once, once Saban came in and took over it, at Alabama, it really did kind of change like we're talking about culture um, as, as a lot more tough nose, getting back to basics 
kind of football. So, and, and Nick Saban's a great leader as well for, you know, he's, he's right up there at, at probably on my list as a top three coach right behind Vince Lombardi as far as my mentors as well. Yeah, you, know, you just think of a system, an organized plan. I mentioned earlier Bill yeah. Walsh's coaching tree. Um, Nick Saban, and with quotes, um, you know, where do they come from and are they altered a little bit for sure? Um, like say the Nike slogan, just do it. How many parents, how many teachers, how many coaches were oh, right. saying, just do it. Just <laughs> shut up and do it. Uh, we had a chance uh, to spend a day with Barrett Jones played for Nick Saban, when th was a red shirt, won three national championships. A great story. We have it. The presentation is on Facebook. We, we need to resurface that now that we're talking about football. Right. And you know, he, he was very interested in what we were doing from a fund from a, as far as fundamentals, as far as how we ran practice. Cause it's, it's really all the same thing. Yeah. Every sport is this comes down to fundamentals. It does. So, um, anyway, he gets up on the podium and he's, He's a red shirt freshman, so it's his second year, and he's right up there. He's holding the trophy, and people are just looking like, "What's he doing up there?" He he won uh, three national championships, became an All American, three different positions. He was a center, a guard, and a tackle. He had to be. He said he had to be an offensive guard because he wasn't big enough, strong enough, athletic enough. Very humble, right. humble guy, and. Uh, he said, well, I, I never got to touch the ball. My mother said, but you'll get to touch the trophy. <laughs> and she just kept telling him that because he would be complaining. I don't ever get to touch it when he's a little kid. I never, get to touch, I never get to touch the ball. He goes, yes, but you'll get to touch the trophy. And so he went right up to the podium. Anyway, it's a, it was touching the trophy. With, so 1959, Lombardi goes to Green Bay. His wife didn't even know it was, was that Minnesota or was that was, was Wisconsin. That was... Uh, Back in the day where you had to buy a map. You, exactly. there, there was no map quest on your phone. Brett Favre didn't even know where, where Green Bay was either. Yeah. Mississippi guy, right? Absolutely. 45. Uh, at one point, he's looking to make a career change. He applied to be a banker. He, he did apply for several jobs. He thought he was going to be close to getting a coach at Wake Forest. But then people were you know, saying, you're never going to get hired because you're an Italian-American. Uh, it's terrible to think that um, that, that was taking place. With, I can remember, uh, I was taught so many different things, uh, how to draw somebody off sides in football. Oh you yeah. Know, they, Papa weren't football, they put in the second string or they had to play four downs. And my next door neighbor, Barney Hagen taught me this trick. A hey, kid, you're off sides. Kid would move and then you're on defense. You just pop the kid. <laughs> and with, um, my train of thought. So senior moment here, popping the kid, um, yeah, so Lombardi, I'll come back to that. Count to three. One, two, three. Um, oh, offense and defense with 20, uh, I'll come back to that. 20 years of prep. Um, day number one, he tells the board of directors, I'm in charge. Making a note here. Uh, that's that's your job. Keep, keep me on track here. Oh, yeah. No, no, I'm just kidding. The, the, uh, the the board of directors, he just says, I'm in charge. And, you know, you know, it just, it's kind of like if you watch the movie Miracle on Ice where Herb Brooks, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm in charge. Yep. <laughs> um, everybody wants to add their own two cents. His frustrations, his frustrations are what made him. He'd worked so hard. Failure was not an option. Actually, in his career, he was never part of a losing team. Mm -hmm. um, his first year at Green Bay, he was um, the rookie. Um, coach of the year. Now I, I, now I'm back to my train of thought. So yeah. So you could pop the guy, sorry, listeners, you could pop the guy on if the, once, once the quarterback says set, nobody on offense can move, right. put in the rules. So I, I didn't have any problem with Italians, but I can remember having, you know, just, just whistle blows in hockey and I go watch this. And I just went up to this kid um, and just called him. I said, you're a dumb, da, 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 wop. And whack, he hits me with a stick <laughs> right, right there. <laughs> and he gets a two minute penalty. But, uh, there's a side story to that too, is that, so I'd call this kid a dumb wop and he'd bigger, stronger. I had no fear on the ice. So after the game, he's, he's ready to, he's in the parking lot. He's waiting for you. And I had a, a 
I, the dad gave me a ride home was the name. He was an Italian. So, but he, they, they, I mean, I had no problem with Italians, but it was, uh, it, it was definitely def a thing at the time, you know, you guinea, da, da, da. Um, but, um, so he goes in and uh, Brett star 17th round pick. That was his leader. That was his quarterback. They were one ten and one the year before. So after the very first day, it's training camp. So Bart Starr's wife is not in Green Bay. And he calls up and he says, we're going to win and we're going to win big. And then we, this is all in line where, oh, yeah. where Bart Starr is going. Relent was, relentless was Lombardi's word. We are relentlessly going to chase perfection. And we're going to catch excellence. You know, he, Jerry Kramer, one of his players wrote the book, Instant Replay. And Lombardi gets credit for when the, um, the players go into a video room. Why don't you say something about that? They don't ever call them by their name. It's just number. Yeah. Yeah. Even as, as illustrious of a career as, as Bart Starr had, he was always number 15 to, to Vince Lombardi. He's like, what is number 15 doing out there? Yeah. You know, Jerry, what's 69 doing? Yeah, That's yeah. Ranitsky, so. It's 66, just, 66. Oh, 66. Thanks. That was my yeah. senior moment coming out right there. Thank you. No, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, for me, I mean, I grew up watching. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to tell you very much about the Green Bay Packers of today. Although Aaron Rodgers, when he was on 60 Minutes, you know, it was Aaron Rodgers. How big is he? 6'1? Uh, yeah, 6'2 or 6'3. Yeah, I think he's pretty big. But, um, the guys, um, you know, give him a hard time about being small. And he goes, I'm not small, you know? And uh, so anyway, the guy interviewing him for 60 minutes said, well, you're so small. And it, it, right there, Aaron Rodgers, you could tell he was upset. Of course. My son Connor played uh, doubles in college with a kid, Pete Cobell, Peter Cobell. I believe he's the head coach now, not the interim head coach at Nebraska. And uh, at Ohio State, six foot seven, he's a giant in tennis, but some of his roommates were football players. They called him Little Petey. <laughs> little Petey. I mean, you know, I think um, it's great when a, a kid gets on a college campus, especially the boys. I mean, the, the people playing big time football, they're like walking statues. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and that's like, a great, that's a great thing about tennis is a little guy can compete in tennis. It's a little more difficult in football. In football. Yeah. You've got to, you kind of have to be a Goliath of your own at some point. That's uh the book, uh, Friday Night Lights, only one player from that team played Division One football. That's true. Easy. Uh, Lombardi, uh, yeah, chasing perfection, catch excellence, losing is not an option. He, Lombardi was great with words. Um, I'm not remotely interested in being good. Right, right. Yeah, it's, uh, this quote after quote. Yeah. And, you know, I think that junior tennis coaches could say, all right, Randy Day assignment, you know, you could take a, you know, one hour video on Lombardi and say you take 12 juniors and you just each give them five minutes. Right. You know, and then, just, you know, watch these five minutes, send me a text. You know, coaches are really busy, but I think that's one way uh, technology can be used. Um, yeah. Lombard star, we're going to win and we're going to win big. Yeah. And I think the other great one from Lombardi is, you know, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. Yeah. And that, that's a quote that so often um, doesn't get that extra word added to it, which is what, you know, not just relentless, but perfect is, you know, the Lombardi way. Three secrets of tennis, practice, practice, practice. Um, yeah, so I mentioned this, he posted grades. Can you imagine? Um, but Lombardi learned to bring humor into it. And, you know, he, he was the one who set the tone, but just, just with a snap of a finger, he would just have to yell. And then boom, yep. everybody zeroed back in. But famous thing with Max McGee, Lombardi hands up, holds up a football and he says, the beginning of the, you know, the dynasty first meeting, he holds up a football and he goes, this is the football. And Max McGee says, coach, you're going too fast. <laughs> and Lombardi just waited and he looked down and, you know, this is, this captures, there's many movies, let alone books on Lombardi. Um, so yeah, Jerry Kramer, his voice was a major skill. Actually, just go back on that, going too fast, is that he looked down and people didn't know really how he was going to react, but he looked up and he just couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> With, um, and you do have to be able to do that. Um, 
speaking of Peter Cobelt, I one time said to Peter, uh, yeah, I heard Ty Tucker, the thing about Ty is that he can tear the skin off of you, which is a gross exaggeration, but, right. th but then uh, an hour later, he can, he can really have you laugh and the Cobelt goes, yeah, but it's not an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, first year, seven, five rookie of the year. It was the first winning season, in 11 years. Lombardi, you're either all in or you're all out. So I, I just know, uh, the people that I've trained over the years from way back when would know this cause we took time in a classroom settings. I mean, that's, yep. it was theoretical. It was, you know, this is a lecture, this is a lab and homework. You always go study Lombardi. Um, I tell kids all the time, you're either a number, you're either a one or a two. Exactly. And, and uh, you're either all in with, I think also too, is that in football, you can comment on this. You can't take it one play off. You know, you, you, you're going to get hurt. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you, you see it even when it comes to like end of games and, and some people want to take a, a playoff and it is one of those where somebody just comes out of nowhere and, and whops them. So, you know, for me, when a kid doesn't serve volley and, and tennis and doubles, it's just like a hockey mentality. If the puck goes in the corner, you go after the puck. And your reward, if you get there first, is you're going to be hit into the boards. You know, <laughs> That's it's like your a, reward. It's like a little bit of a car accident. Here, right. it, here it comes. Boom. And, I mean, I um, Lombardi had a great a word that he used all, all the time. Is don't be a coward. You know, you're a coward if you don't go. If you don't serve volley in my world, in doubles, you're a coward. That's it's true. What happens to chickens? They get eaten. Um, with players responded to his values, his discipline, his leadership. They believed in the method of his madness. Um, so many pearls. This is a great one. You can't coach if the player has not been taught. You know, um, I know you work for Greg, yeah. Greg Patton, great guy. And, uh, you know, he's just a great spirit, great guy for tennis. And, and, uh, you know, he's a college coach and it's, it's different when you're working with a college coach, you're recruiting people who can play. They already have, right. they already have games. You know, if you're working with, uh, here comes 28 year olds, you know, yeah. you got to try your very best to get, put a smile on your face because it's, especially as I say, 20, 12 year olds and they've already been playing four years of tennis and the, the, the grips are awful. The swings are awful. And it's like, right. Oh boy, what are we going to do here? Um, yeah, the nuggets of gold. Um, here's something. Uh, basic reps turn into instincts. His basics were possession, blocking, and tackling. Why don't you talk a little bit about possession as a football nut? How would you explain that to tennis people? Yeah, so possession would really be in, in football when you have the ball and are able to move it forward down the field um, and score. So, you know, possession can change in an instant. You know, you can have an interception where the offense is, ha is holding possession and then he throws the ball and a defender catches that instead. And then possession immediately turns over to the defense. Now, if that defender then goes and fumbles the ball and it goes back to that offensive player, then it stays with the possession of the offense. So, you know, so much possession and, and momentum can be shifted in just such a short, short amount of time just like tennis would be right yeah i think it's so key with uh reducing unforced errors you know there is a f the, the word fumble yeah there's a, a lot more unforced errors than there are fumbles but i, I tell people all the time um in the u.s of a hundred thousand people in the stadium and the larry zonka the fullback they're going up the middle they're hanging on the ball with both hands you know put <laughs> put it in the bread basket exactly Everybody in the stadium would know if the fullback's running through the line of scrimmage, hanging on the ball with one hand. Exactly. And then secondly, I mean, even in the open field, they'll sometimes even um, palm the ball like a basketball so they can use both arms to pump and yeah. run, run faster. Yeah. But it's um, dangerous. Other, other is other three basics besides possession, blocking and tackling. Uh, people my age grew up knowing Lombardi and the Packers because people cover the best. Lombardi was a rock star of sport. Um, okay, so uh, Matthews, I won't call you Ethan. Matthews! Today <laughs> if you I had a number, you'd probably call me by that, though. Yeah, uh, that's a good line. Matthews, you weren't on Lombardi time. Explain that today. Yeah, so, um, you know, Lombardi would always say to his players, if you're 
10 minutes early, you're five minutes late. Um, and so I, unfortunately, was, without saying any excuses, was late to this morning to getting here at 7. I got here at 7.30 when we were supposed to start, um, but Lombardi time would have been 7.15. So to one of those where you show up, you be prepared, you're, you're ready to go when the whistle blows. So with uh, drinking coffee, you know, I sometimes I hold back now, but uh, I'll tell you parents, what do you have to jumpstart your heart? What do you need coffee for? And yeah, but if you're hooked, you're hooked. I understand. Right. But uh, with Lombardi, yeah, you, yeah, 10 minutes early, five minutes late. There's a story about Jerry Kramer, number 64. Uh, besides instant replay, there's a distant replay as well. There was a follow up written years later. Right. And with, um, so the, the rookies had to come in, you know, three, four days early. So he's no longer a rookie, but he shows up, they're getting together and he's there day one. But at the end, you know, they, they, they think they're going to stay in the dorm. Right. And, uh, they can't get in the dorm. The dorm's locked. They Lombardi, just let him in the dorm and he goes, all right. So they get a room in the dorm and so the next day, um, they're going to play golf where the rookies are practicing. And Lombardi goes, where are you going? Get back here. You stay in the dorm, you practice. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think this is important. Break up, build up. I do think that uh, there's too much cheerleading in junior tennis. You're awesome. Just I think that's in um, a, lot of, a lot of adult situations where people are edifying. Just you're great, I'm great, we're all great. Um, Gary Kramer, you have the attention span. A, a college kid, college has a five year, five minute attention span. A high school kid, three minutes. Kindergarten, thirty seconds. And you're worse than that. <laughs> but he said it. You know, he go, you know, he puts his head down. He goes to the locker room. He's just staring at the, staring at the floor. And it, he go, but then uh, Lombardi came by and said, you know, Kramer, I think you could be one of the best guards in football. Um, coming back to film, Max McGee, he was a funny guy. He actually in the first uh, first Super Bowl he had a great game, but he went out that night. Yes, he was always yes. uh, he was always finding those guys. Paul Horning for breaking curfew. <laughs> Paul Horn Horning number five. He was a Heisman Trophy winner at Notre Dame, and uh, they were, we thought they were he was going to be the star quarterback. And uh, he goes in Lombardi winning his coach. He, he told the board of directors he is not our quarterback. He can't throw the ball. Mm -hmm. Yep. He's going to be our running back. And Lombardi said he's the best player every coach from the 10 yard line in. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it was Paul Horning's line was that you'd rather give the ball to a milk drinker or a whiskey drinker. <laughs> so anyway, Horning would like to break curfew and drink, drink whiskey. Uh, but what Max McGee said, this comes back to the book, instant replay. Um, the, the Packers would win on Sunday. Then on Monday, they look at the film and they would come out. And they would go, or Max McGee, I thought we won that game. <laughs> because, by the, because they would win the game. They'd, they'd get laid into by Lombardi. Exactly, huh? exactly. Lombardi's wife, she never missed a game, knew everything. Um, said he made football players out of men. He made men out of football players. And he was more proud of making men out of football players. Second year, they were the conference champs. They lost um, to Philadelphia. They had nine yards to go, but they... This is a, a great line. Winners don't lose. They just run out of time. Exactly. And the Packers ran out of time. Yep. yep. They, they, were, they just needed, they needed a little more time on the clock. I think in that documentary that uh, The Last Dance, Jordan says that he, he's never lost a game. He just ran out of time. Yeah. So, it, it, again, going back to quotes, you probably took it from Lombardi. <laughs> well, then also do the history, but just think about Lombardi's history. Um, True. You know, the, you know, the coach at West Point, the, the coach at Fordham. Um, yeah. Yeah. Where do quotes come from? But the thing about Lombardi is he does, he didn't just say the quote, he lived the quote. Exactly. Quotes don't work unless you do. Uh, he told the players, he congratulated them at the end of the game. They thought he was going to come in and they're just going to get chewed out. He said, you guys played hard, but we will never lose in a final game again. Nice. Um, sacrifice is a big Lombardi word. So he knew the wife sacrificed, and at the end of uh, 
one of the first years he gave every wife a fur coat and um and the players who weren't married they were told to bring their moms and um they were uh, given the, the moms were mailed a fur coat if they couldn't come but uh paul horning um Max McGee, they wanted to, they just take the fur coat instead of having it mailed to their mom. Right. And Lombardi said, no, 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 no. He goes, you're just going to give that to some dame tonight at some bar. The season's over. And he goes, you know, he goes, you guys, and he would just tell her, he goes, you guys go do whatever you want. Just don't get in trouble, but be back here. When you're back here, you better be in shape. <laughs> uh, next year, they win the championship. First one, they beat the Giants, his beloved Giants, 37-0. But in his speech over that, you know, he said was so true is sometimes a team doesn't have a good game and they had their best game and the giants didn't have their best best yep. game yep. Um, he was offered the job to be the, the giants and uh, everybody thought he would take it then he met with his players and he said i'm not leaving i'm staying in green bay so beautiful and, and then so they, great. and then they said afterwards you know they would follow him into a burning fire after that right yeah. oh. i can see you smiling you're you're gives you're, me chills you're, a, pa you're a packer fan baby <laughs> The power sweep. Talk a little bit about the power sweep. Oh, man. I mean, Lombardi says it so so best, but he could do an eight-hour seminar on just the Packers sweep. Uh, that was kind of the uh, cornerstone of the offense, if you will. And, you know, he'd be out there with his whiteboard, and he'd be drawing up all the plays, saying, we're going to have the guard pull this way, and the, and the tackle pull this way, and we're going to run it up their throats until they learn to stop it. And just the entire time he's talking about it, I, I you could just feel it crescendo in and building. I was fortunate to spend time with uh, the late Tim Gullickson. I did a couple corporate outings with Tom Gullickson. Ponca City, Oklahoma comes to my mind. But um, then I met him when my son was playing pro tennis and he was with the USTA. But with Tim, I remember I hit it off with Tim quite quite well because he's from Wisconsin. Oh, yes. And it's like, you know, I just started talking to him about John, or excuse me, uh, we talk about John Madden next, but um, it's in my notes here, John Madden, but to talk to Gully about, because he was a huge Packer fan. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. I mean, John Madden, um, he's, there's a, a video clip and he was coaching junior college football. Now he later, he went later went on with the Oakland Raiders and won, yeah. a, ma won a major. Every, anybody in football, you know, knows John Madden. Yeah. Um, what a great commentator. Uh, the late John Madden, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, Madden, Madden said, yeah, I thought I knew quite a bit about football and I was in the back and I didn't have a notebook. And he goes, how dumb was I? And that's where it's, you can actually watch Lombardi go over the power sweep. He didn't invent it, but he, it's kind of like Snoopy with a double fault. Exactly. Um, I didn't invent the double fault. I just perfected it. <laughs> so that's what they said about Lombardi. He didn't, he didn't invent the power sweep, but he perfected it. But he would take four hours at a coaching clinic, have mm -hmm. lunch, come back for four hours. This, and that, that's one thing about football too yeah. is, is uh you know people people when they think about studying film there's no secrets they're trying to have as many secrets as they can because exactly. when, when, when they come up to call play and how the quarterback calls an audible and the change the change the play to the line of scrimmage yep. um you know it's just so sad the tennis kids they have no patterns you know well yeah once in a while or maybe too much i run around and hit my four and other than that no i don't play pro shots no i don't yeah. play approach volleys yeah i don't serve volley i mean that's where I heard Where's the tactics in that, right? Before we started, we were listening to Andy Murray talking about Alcaraz. You know, he's just talking about any era that kid wins because he's just so complete. Oh, yeah. And what Andy was saying, to go off on a tangent with that, Andy was saying, well, he thinks that the players today, you know, certainly, okay, there's going to be players that have bigger serves and bigger forehands. Yeah. But they have, uh, he was being nice. He said they definitely have weaknesses. You know, he'd say bigger, bigger weaknesses, but <laughs> I think it is a weakness if you can't go to the net. Um, another, another year in 62, uh, win a championship. Um, so he turned New York down. So it's like he became an outsider to New York, but he, yep. he was the, the Pope of Green Bay. Absolutely. Um, going fast here, use football to teach life, uh, values and principles. You know, coming back to the priesthood, he, he did go to law school, but didn't like it. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was another thing that, um, uh, people said that helped him out as a coach, just having gone through that experience, yeah, yeah. Uh, just a broader perspective. And um, people loved his meetings. 
is the players, they, they, they love the meetings. <laughs> they didn't, the practices were like, whoa. Right. And also too, is that he didn't practice as many hours, but the intensity. Um, but it, it, his, his meetings uh, were not, even though he really knew the X's and O's, but his meetings were more about character and more character. He was a molder of character. Um, the X's and O's, I mean, certainly you have to go over it, but yeah. um, every Sunday they have a party at his house. Um, you know, back in the day, I mean, everybody was smoking cigarettes and, you know, it was very common. Uh, you know, when I grew up, a highball was what parents would drink at a party. Oh, you know, right. that, that was a shot of whiskey and something else, you yeah. know, seven and seven rum and Coke. And, um, but Monday morning, it was back to work 63 and 64 winning seasons. But for them, like to lose in a conference final to finish second, um, that was a losing season. That was, yep. Yep. It's, yeah. it's super bowl or bust when it comes to the Packers. Yeah. Um, there's another pearl with Lombardi again for tennis. If they understand, they will do it right. Well, you know, we want, we want people to be able to demonstrate left-handed, right-handed. We want people to be able to teach the, you know, it's not what the teacher knows. It's what the student learns. And so yet, then that feedback so exchange, true. um, never demanded uh, more from others than he demanded from himself. Um, I mean, he worked from 7 a.m. to 1 a.m. Yeah. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Incredible. <laughs> the, uh, uh, more Lombardi, uh, you can teach by the book, but you can't coach by the book. That's true. You kind of have to go off script a lot of times when you're coaching. Yeah, you know, people come to see us for technique, but it's, is if, if you can't teach character, you can't teach technique. True. Um, uh, there will be a fourth quarter and we will be the fittest. Um, this is one of my favorites, fatigue. Maybe I already read that mm. earlier, yep. said earlier, repeat it. Fatigue will make cowards of us all. Um, words, words used to describe Lombardi, what would you come up with? Oh, well, the first one always comes is relentless, um, caring. I think that's, that's yeah, probably that's... the second biggest one is caring. Yeah, how's it go that you don't, you don't care what you know until they know that you care. Exactly, yep. These are that I wrote down from my notes. Emotional, volatile, strict, principled, clear, simple, consistent, trusting, mm -hmm. loving. That first one, emotional, I think is, is a big reason why he was able to get so much out of Bart Starr. Um, just, just being a, his leader to show him, yeah, he can do it. Like you are a quarterback. This is how you're, you can go. Um, Bart Starr, there's a story where he met with a coach and he said, coach, you can scream, yell at me, chew me out, but you got to do it in this room because if you want me to be my, if you want me to be the leader, yep. you can't do it in front of all the players. Exactly. And he said he never, uh, you know, never did it on, on the field. It was always star in my office. <laughs> and uh, so people knew that he was, he was taking it, but it was just not on the field. It was in closed doors. Yeah. Um, the film sessions were not a joy. We talked about that, you know, now, who's 15? Who's 64? <laughs> <laughs> and he would just show the mistakes. That's what, you know, I saw with Sam Volo when I was yeah. a kid. Um, it's the mistakes that players would make. And, you know, what's this, you know, my mother used to say, it's okay to make a mistake, but don't make the same mistake again. If you, if you make a mix, this is how she said, if you make a mistake and you don't correct it, you made a second mistake. Yep. Um, this is not swearing. Um, actually, this is, uh, comes to my mind as a, when I was when I was a kid in Potsdam, New York, the uh, the next town over is Canton, New York. The high school rivalry, Potsdam, Canton, but also in Canton was St. Lawrence. So Clarkson, they didn't want to lose to St. Lawrence. Pot, yeah. Potsdam didn't want to lose to Canton. And there used to be a sign on your way from Potsdam to Canton. It said Shell, like Shell gas station. Oh, yeah. Shell, ten miles. <laughs> and they kept taking the S off. Hell, ten miles. <laughs> but but uh, Lombardi, he would if you listen to him online. And that, it's amazing that you can do that. What the hell? Yeah. Who the hell? Yep. When the hell? Why in the hell? Is to just yell it out. Yep. What in the hell are you doing? And boom, just stop. You know, everybody, exactly. you know, everybody laughing, but just, I mean, all right. It's now you can't hear a pin drop. Yeah. Yeah. It, that, that, I say that wrong. Now you could hear a pin yeah, drop. Yeah, you could, right? <laughs> it, it's funny. There's a, 
there's a, a bit of film of him online where he's on, on the sideline and he's mic'd up for the game. One of the first ones he's in his big long trench coat and he does one of those, what the hell is going on out here? Kind of thing. You, and that's say, stuck that, with say, me. say that again. You even sound like him. Yeah. What, what the, the hell is going on out here? <laughs> just, Cause that's lived in my brain rent free since I was a child. <laughs> that's great. Uh, instant hostility. I mean, really, it comes down to it. I ask kids all the time, your parents ever get mad? And they all get it. I said, yeah, you don't really need to raise your hand. But, you know, I think of a young girl years ago, Julia Hutchke is like, okay, here's the perfect child. And, you know, but she didn't force very much. You have to find, you got to find something buttons to push. Right. You know, and there's a famous story about Herb Brooks, one of his players, Callahan. You know, you say, ah, smart kid, could have gone to Harvard. And he, he went to BU. He didn't want to be one of the blue blood preppies at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, he calls him in the meeting and he said, you know, you know, um, when I call you Callie, you know, or I, how it goes, Callie, Callie, and when he calls, I'm going to call you by one of those. You've done nothing wrong, but I'm going to just be all over your case. And because you're the toughest kid on the team. Mm -hmm. And if I give you a hard time, and you take it, everything's going to go up a level. Oh, beautiful. You know, so that's, that's coaching genius, but instant, yeah. instant hostility. Um, just like, boom, you know, what the hell? And it's like, <laughs> okay, all right. right. Cause, Cause the coach really needs to, you know, you can laugh and whatever, but just snap the fingers and, and okay, you, get you, back you, to you change the, change the tone. Mm -hmm. Um, hit the microphone, unforced air. Um, his meetings of his meetings on life skills were a joy difference maker. He made people feel like winners. You know, Paul Terry was, was, uh, was known for that, you know, where Carleen Bassett, who I spent time with said that Nick was, uh, the, the worst pro coach in the world. Cause the pro is the boss, yeah. but the best junior coach in the world. I once saw him saw Nick in his seventies. He was helping out Donnelly young and Donnelly young, like all tennis players are 99%. I understand Rafa never did that, but he, he, you know, breaks a racket on the court, yells out the famous F word fire truck. And Balateri was up on the, the crow's nest, something that comes from football. Right. Yep. You know, coach puts him up, up top where they could see everyone. And, uh, Balateri came down that, uh, ladder so fast. He was out on the court and it was like a scene from this TV show years ago called the twilight zone. Everything stopped. I mean, everyone, the referees stopped. Everyone's like, everyone's standing still. No, no one was playing anymore. Every court stopped. Volunteer was on the court with Don Young. He's got his fingers just pointing him and he's got his finger in the chest, you know, <laughs> with, uh, um, and that's, you know, Nick had people, you know, would say, oh, you know, he wasn't the best technician in the world, but I know Jim Lair was on our podcast. You know, he, Jim used to say, if everybody could just have a dose of Nick Volunteer. Right. And that, that's what Lombardi had the dose. It's medicine. It's medicine. Exactly. And that's why they call it a dose. Exactly. You, you, you don't have to be that all the time. Right. But there's certain times where you got to have to bring that out. There was a comment, oh, he treats us like dogs. And th then that was discussed. And, you know, he would, his genius was he didn't treat everybody the same. Yeah. You know, he knew he had to, how to, how to, and then in that sense, as a coach, you have to be a little schizophrenic. You can't teach it. You can't treat everyone the same. True. Um, that line doesn't apply today. Just think about how dogs are treated today. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's people used to, people used to use the line. I'm in the doghouse because when I was a kid, people if they had a dog, they had this little miniature house outside, and the dog slept outside. The right. dog, the dog didn't go in the house. <laughs> Seriously, it's just like they didn't sleep on the bed with you at the foot. Yeah, no? it's uh, it's definitely changed. Um, everything Lombardi said has been analyzed. Um, he was consistent, but again with his players um like the movie from uh the movie rocky adrian rocky uh, rocky about adrian mm -hmm. she's got gaps i got gaps together we fill gaps and then and, he, and he's quote is saying that is that he, he goes i need to fill gaps and i think that's an art form i mean i know that's an art form yeah and that that art form for him is one of the reasons that he's a, you know referred to as a genius true Lombardi, if he believed in something, he fought for it. Um, we mentioned the thing about Lombardi being colorblind. Mm -hmm. My players are green. Uh, he was a, a, a Kennedy Democrat, but uh, Nixon uh, in 1968 had mentioned that uh, 
he was going to possibly ask Vince Lombardi to be his running mate. I did not know that. But Lombardi, uh, you know, he was his son. His son was asked Vince Jr. about him being a CEO and said, no, is it really in the end? Uh, um, he had the ability to leave, but he just knew in the end that he was a football coach. Because right. when, he, when, he, when he left Green Bay and didn't have a team for that one year, then he went yeah. to Washington. And shortly, shortly after, he was only there one year. Um, Lombardi, he loved being American and loved America. Here's a great Lombardi quote. If you want to be the best you can, you should live in another country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need to get that back. Come on. I mean, exactly. His wife was a Republican and he was a Democrat and they used to argue. My mother was a Democrat. My father was Republican. And certainly they could, you know, argue might be the wrong word, but even with Marie Lombardi and Vince Lombardi. Mm -hmm. But now there's, that's, that's a whole nother conversation is that yeah. there's no center anymore. There's too far left, too far right. <laughs> T TV rights and it's crazy. The news used to be the news. Um, he once said, if you're not being about the best you can be, um, you should find another country to live in. You know, that's that, that line, you know, um, love it or leave it. Yep. I think he, he would have been okay if he had that. On. Exactly. My grandfather used to have that on his, uh, on his bumper. Love it or leave it. Um, uh, his players are like children. Um, he always had the uh, extra push for he ones that he thought on his team were the gifted children. So he's a little bit tougher on the superstars. Yeah, yeah. The the Jim Taylors and the Paul Hornings of the of the Packer world. Packer world, excuse me. Yeah, we've had Rob Krychek on our podcast, and he played basketball in college, but he played football like so many kids growing up. Farm boy Krychek, he, um, I used to always have him tell, he tell the juniors this again, is what do you do when you're about to be tackled? And that was Jim Taylor. He said he would, the guy, the linebacker, or whoever is storming at him, coming at him full tilt, and the running back puts his head down and he, you know, he knocks the attacking player, mm -hmm. attacking defender, about to tackle him, knocks him back. Um, give me, give me, you got some quotes circled, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, one of the first ones that I noticed is the confidence is contagious and so is lack of confidence. It's it's just so prevalent. I mean, we talk about Lombardi. It seemed like he oozed confidence wherever he went and that that did, in effect, kind of rub off <clears throat> on on his students and his players that that he kind of interacted with. Yeah, he's got one about being fired with enthusiasm. They, they'll say yeah. that enthusiasm is contagious and so is the lack of it. Here's one. If you aren't fired with enthusiasm, <laughs> you'll be fired with enthusiasm. <laughs> I, I, really, I actually had that one written down. I was about to read that one, Coach. Give me, give me another one. <laughs> All right. Uh, winning is a habit. Watch your thoughts. They become your beliefs. Watch your beliefs. They become your words. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your actions. They become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. And it's just character is everything when it yeah. comes to sports, right? Yeah, Margaret Thatcher has something very yeah. similar to that. With um, uh, Here's one that he said that later that he wished he had not said, because this is one that was repeated the most. It's, it is a catchy phrase. Winning is not everything. It's the only thing. Later he said, I wish I could replace it with this. And this is great. If you leave every fiber that you have within you, in any endeavor you have won. Yes. You know, when he says, you know, every fiber, every ounce that you have to give. That's, that's awesome. Um, accused of being bipolar, uh, but that was not really true. It was, the thing was, is that he was just, again, had that switch. Yep. Like, boom, like, oh, he was just laughing, but now he's not laughing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he had that switch. And I think, I think that teddy bear to grizzly bear, uh, that's a gift. It is. That's a gift. If you can make people, you know, make people cry, make people laugh. You don't, you don't get up. I mean, you don't get up with the idea that you're, you're, you're making them cry. Um, right. I tell stories all the time. I've learned so much from tennis parents. I was telling one the other day, that a mom, a young girl said uh, to her mother, um, I don't want, I don't want you to watch me play. And the mother said, you are not going to tell me what to do. <laughs> if I want to watch you play, I'll watch you play. If I don't want to watch you play, I won't watch you play. Right next you know just <laughs> next it's just like you know cut the interference cut the crap let's go forward that's great with lombardi everything was from the heart 
um, with, um, I love how you said caring. You're not, not 99%, 100%. Exactly. Um, never let us players coast. Have fun, but there is an edge. Um, Laugh you know, and win. There's that snap in football, but there's also that snap in intensity. Yeah. I, I hear it go time. And that's where that final drive in 1967, they had 60, yep. 68, 68 yards yep. to go. Um, for the longest time, Vic Braden used to say that Emilio Zapotec was his favorite athlete, this Czech runner who had very poor running technique, but was just tougher than nails. But um, at one point after that, Braden was saying John Elway, the quarterback from Denver, mm -hmm. was his, uh, was also a really good baseball player and chose, chose football. But he said that he, um, he loved Elway because Elway won he thrived on, you know, less than two minutes to go, 98 yards yes. to go. That's what I love about football. That is, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to witness when, when a team can do that. Now, if it's against your team, it's not a beautiful thing to witness. <laughs> <laughs> but they really practice that. You know, I think we've talked about, um, just talking about coaches in general with these podcasts, Don Shula, um, he was the first coach that want, wanted to have his players practice the night before um, in a large area. Yeah. And what they would do is rent the top floor of the of a parking garage and they would go play after play. I've been fortunate enough to coach many uh, – well, some NFL players take to have taken tennis lessons from me, but I've coached some children of NFL players. And, you know, like the night before the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. now they have a big conference room. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's, it's like over going over plays over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And doing the walkthrough. And, and yeah, and they do. Um, yeah, that's great walkthrough. They, I tell kids all the time, the football players will play, they'll practice the walkthrough. There's no ball, no equipment, no opponents, and they're just going through positioning. Yeah. Um, the, uh, coach Tony McGee, he played at Michigan, started, I coached his kid, I should say, I could tell more Tony McGee stories than Tony McGee. So he, <laughs> he, uh, um, he goes to the NFL and he's, he lines up the same way on both sides, whether he's on the left side, the line of scrimmage, the right side, mm -hmm. and the coach says to him, Hey kid, switch your feet. And he says, no, I like it this way, coach. He goes, switch your feet. You know what NFL stands for? Not for long. <laughs> With, uh, I one time was in a speech class. It was a graduate course at the University of Texas at Tyler. And this gentleman, he played Canadian football. And he talked about, you know, he was a star in Pop Warner and junior high and in high school. And he played at Baylor and, and uh, just talked about, you know, the cutoffs, how difficult mm -hmm. it is, I mean, to get to that level. As a coach, uh, I think this was for, for the coaches we talked we talked to in tennis. You know, go in hard first. Uh, don't be their friend first. You don't, don't go in soft. Don't try to win yeah. them over with kindness. Win them over with Lombardi is uh, win them over with respect. Exactly. We've talked about Brad, Brad Gilbert. I think Gilbert has a you know a lot of positives. But you know, if you're coaching Coco Goff and she's five in the world. You know, it's a little different. Oh, yeah. You, you, you're taking somebody from the top. I mean, it's like with Fetter was asked when Lendl was coaching uh, Zverev, what do you think? And the media was making such a hype out of it. And he goes, well, because I don't know. I, Ivan Lendl goes, I'm sure I can. he can help him, but he's already three in the world. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, Lombardi, over and over again, it's okay to get knocked down, but it's all about getting up. Yep. Love practice, love conditioning, love repetition. Run a play over and over again. Um, in high school, he had the, he would have cheap spaghetti dinners. Uh, There's no money, and the players would come over. And you know, again, how do you go 32 and 0? It's not till you get to the pros and junior tennis players need to know the pros practice from nine to five. Yeah, it's their job. It's their, their career. It's their job, and you know, student athletes can't do that because of homework, because of schoolwork. If they're mm -hmm. you know, regular school or six hours in a classroom. There's yeah. only so many hours in the day. Five titles, seven years. I mean, he was there nine years, but it was five and seven. Um, pride plus performance equals winning. Lombardi. Straight shooter. He wanted his players. He looked people straight in the eye. He wanted them to look them straight in the eye. We always tell kids when we're talking to them, stop, hug your racket, and look right at me. Yeah. They, they just yeah. They keep walking, you know. Um, 
the gospel of, of Lombardi. He had rules, the rules were on the wall. And uh, so he, his players were funny. He was, uh, tell us about the uh, Lombardi commandments. He had more than 10. <laughs> <laughs> With uh, 1967 ice ball, our listeners could look that up. Uh, the referee, it was so cold that the first time he blew the whistle, I remember seeing a dog do this, where I, I grew up, it was so cold. And um, his golden retriever, his tongue was, you know, those guardrails. Yeah. I don't know, you're crossing the street from to go to school. Um, they, were, they were in a hurry to get hot water to, to have uh, the, the the dog's tongue was stuck to the metal yeah. um, guardrail. So anyway, what happened to the referee in the 1960s, it was so cold, the ice bowl, that he pulled the whistle out of his mouth, he tore his lip, he's bleeding. There, it's interesting you do a deep dive into something. Oh yeah. I never, I never do this until going through this again. And, and again, we studied Lombardi back in the day in the in the in the eighties in this tennis teaching school. Yeah, and here's something interesting about that ice bowl is that in, you know Lombardi actually was the first pioneer to have a heated field. Yeah. So he put in a heating system underneath the the Packer Stadium so that on cold days like that the field wouldn't you know harden up. But unfortunately it didn't work properly on that day. You're right. And it and it turned horribly it was an horribly ice field but the, yeah. they didn't use whistles after that the referees they didn't use whistles it was too cold they didn't have plastic whistles yes. and, uh, <laughs> but yeah i remember reading about this they say light light gadgets um with uh fuzzy thurston from that ice bowl they asked him how he survived he said i had 10 shots of vodka <laughs> 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 with uh We've had a podcast on Richard Williams on the movie, but Richard Williams, the U.S. Open champion, he was one of the six water survivors from the Titanic. And he was asked, they wanted to amputate his legs and he refused. Um, and it was after, was it April 12th or no? It was April 1912, I guess. But anyway, the Titanic goes down and Richard Williams, they asked him you know, how, he, how did you survive the chilling water? And he... Um, Said I, I the chip was going down. I tried to eat as much food as I could and drink as much booze as I could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting. Uh, Hundred five players played for Lombardi. Um, he was a master of mixing unkind words with kind words. <laughs> I, I repeating myself, but we say this all the time, kids. There is no negative. There is no positive. It just is. Yep. Yeah, you and, said one uh, a while back that was like, you know, a player was doing something and you're like, oh, you need to do this and this on your backhand. And then she did it. And then she, is that good? And you're like, in tennis, there is no good or bad. There is only better. Yeah. And it just, it just rings so true with that. This is important. Uh, reinforcing this note taking from his days being a high school teacher with the Green Bay Packers, write it down. Mm -hmm. demand his play, he demanded that his players take notes. Yeah. You know, it's, it's abysmal. We have uh, these videos made and the kids don't send notes, you know, write it down. And then what they'll do is they'll, some kids will write it and they take a snapshot, send mm -hmm. it to you. I said, no, no, no. You now type it, Yeah, write it and type it to hear it is to forget it, to write it down is to remember it, to do it um, is to understand it. Your notes should be clear and simple. Brevity and clarity are the key factors in communication. Um, you know, so again, he treated the Green Bay Packers um, just like he was teaching Latin, chemistry, and physics mm -hmm. in high school. Jerry Kramer said, um, a number of his players have said this, but uh, he would say, you know, get everything, get everybody really quiet. And he would say, gentlemen, you're the greatest team ever assembled. And then he would tear them apart. <laughs> <laughs> um, you must like this, Title Town. Oh. That's been my fantasy football name for the last three or four years, it seems like. Football capital of the world. Absolutely. 13 NFL championships and counting. This one documentary says it's the football capital of the world, but it's also a place where they produce toilet paper. <laughs> I don't know if they still have that, that toilet pa paper factory. Um, the uh, missionary zeal. Dennis Vandermeer used to say that his father was a missionary is that you have to have missionary zeal for practice. You got to get people pumped up to practice. Mm -hmm. 
like Patrick Macron said about yeah. the Bryan brothers, those guys get pumped up for breakfast. Yeah. You got to be pumped up. I mean, that's right to his parents. No, you don't need to coffee. You don't need to jumpstart your heart. <laughs> the one thing that people have to understand is that coaches, it has to be shared humor. You know, I've got to the point where I, for many, many years ago is, you know, being older and bald, they say, okay, you got to be over 50 or over 60, mm -hmm. getting close to be able to say over 70. <laughs> and you got to be bald to use, to use nicknames. I don't make them stick. Like the Aussies, you know, they're just, just the, the nicknames. It's easy with it. But shared humor. I mean, Green Bay. Uh, Green Bay is for polar bears, penguins, and Packers. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have a cover for stadium, right? They still play outside. Oh, no, yeah. It's 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 a nickname, the frozen tundra, for a reason. So, like, when it comes to January and February, it's just like the ice bowl every single year. And if they get to play in the playoffs. <laughs> uh, I saved this to last year. Ray Shonky. Um, Andy Brandy was working, uh, Potomac, Maryland, I believe is where it was. Uh, Donald Dell, Christina Dell was here with her kids earlier in the summer. Donald Dell, that's another legend of sport. Mm -hmm. Um, you can talk about so many things, uh, not to get off on a tangent, but that movie air. Oh yeah. You know, with so, Michael. Yeah. So Donald, or about Donald Dell, he was, uh, his picture was on the wall that, that movie air, um, Moses Malone is in that. And I, one time very quickly, I was going to my grandfather's funeral. My brother couldn't go. He was called up to be the head coach of the Winnipeg jets. And, um, he was, um, that whole thing was in turmoil. And, but I, I, I went into LA and it just worked out the Winnipeg jets and whatever team Moses Malone played for, I'm going to guess Philadelphia East coast team, whatever, but they were out in California to play for, uh, play against the Lakers. So these hockey players are in a bar right by the airport. Next day I'm flying out to go to a funeral. And uh, so Moses Malone's in that movie. And um, so I remember Mo Moses Malone in a bathroom waiting to use a urinal. And he said, you don't buy beer, you rent it. <laughs> um, who's the CEO of Nike? Uh, Phil. Oh, Phil Knight. Phil, Phil Knight. Knight, yeah. I was in Moscow. And I give to go there. I went there to study sport, and I, I was out, outfitted with Nike. In Hamilton, saw me, calls my name out. This is 1987. Like, who knows me in Moscow? Smith. No, that's not me. Steve Smith. So I beat Phil Knight, and uh, I did have him on Nike from top to bottom. We looked at my feet. I, have, I had on the shoes from the street entrepreneur. I tr I'd given a pair of Nikes. So uh -huh. he, this kid took us around, showed, take, took us to Gorky Park and the Moscow Circus and whatever. So anyway. For me to go look at a movie that was uh, made in uh, 84, you know, like Donald Dell's pictures on the wall. Uh, he was the agent of Michael Jordan. It's just amazing all the different connections. So, so I got to go back to Ray Shonky. But what did what did Phil say when you saw your, you didn't have those shoes? No, he, he gave me a look that they, they captured him in the meeting. He gave Phil, everybody's heard that expression, if a look could kill. <laughs> he looked at my shoes. And I, you know, I'm giving this, this little tennis teaching pro ten free shoes and he's not even wearing them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's going to go give them away. <laughs> that, that's, he was not a happy camper with, uh, um, the, uh, but yeah, just the flashback of 1984 but to go back for me, a flashback of the Green Bay Packers. So when the Packers are, um, winning in the sixties, I mean, I'm just in love with football and living in this football town my parents had moved to. So you turn a clock ahead. So it, Andy Brandy, that's how I got off on the tangent. He was in Washington and Ray Shonky was in Washington. At that time, Ray Shonky was retired, but Shonky was the only player that was in Washington that had been in Green Bay. Mm -hmm. So he's the only player yeah. uh, that had experienced Lombardi and everybody's like, I can't be that bad. <laughs> and, 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 and Shonky said, yeah, it's that bad. Um, so... So I get, back in the day, no cell phone. So I get this phone call from Andy Brandy. Then I get this phone call from Shonky. And at that time, the Vic Braden Tennis School, it was a place people wanted to go to. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, he comes out, he comes out by himself and, you know, he's retired, but um, he played for Lombardi. So here I, my day was, I had breakfast with him and then worked with him on the court. Mm -hmm. Then he went through the entire camp, you know, two sessions. Vic, think, yeah. I think uh, if he could handle Lombardi's, <laughs> two sessions a day he, 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 yeah. could, he could handle the resort oh yeah resort tennis 
at Cota de Casa. So then I had this kid from Brazil at the time and he might've been like 13. He was a young, small guy. So I worked with the two, two of them after it was three practices mm -hmm. and he was like totally into it. Lunch, dinner, and I'm totally into it. And one thing is he had a tennis court and, you know, I was telling him, you got to build a backboard. So you, you know, right. you're going to go build a backboard. Um, uh, uh, remind me that at the end about his tennis court. So, um, so anyway, he said in the locker room, or I should say the training room, he said that Lombardi would just go in and crutches would be flying. You know, people had ankles that were as big as a grapefruit and, you know, some of that, okay, that needs, that, that is better now, but, but, but back in the day, it's like, hopefully they weren't giving them horse tranquilizers, but, <laughs> but, um, you know, he said, you know, if people have sprained ankles, you go, go run it off. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Get back on the practice field. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a film of Ray Nitschke. Uh, he intercepts, intercept, they're, they're way ahead, but towards the end of the game, he intercepts a pass mm -hmm. and he, he actually limps. No one's around him the way it works out. He has to just limp like eight yards into the end zone mm -hmm. with, um, but Shonky, um, he, when he would come to the tennis court, he would climb over the fence. I go, what are you doing? I go, you could go through the gate. That would be a little more efficient. <laughs> and even today I use that, you know, well, if you want to be efficient, you go through the gate. If you want to be inefficient, you climb over, you the, climb fence. over the fence. Where yeah. that comes from is he climbs over the fence. I go, what are you doing? He goes, I'm intimidating the people I'm playing with. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, this kid from Brazil, they came to spend time with Vic, but I was assigned to this kid and the family trying to decide, should he pursue tennis or pursue soccer? And so he's a, he's a good tennis player. Mm -hmm. So those guys would play. And, um, but what Shonky said that it was so tough and he's a big grown guy, he was an interior lineman. And, um, he said that what he would do when he would come home from a Lombardi practice is he would pull off to the side of the road. He would just cry. <laughs> he said, you know, he goes, I think everybody did that. He goes, you, you, didn't, want, you didn't want to cry in front of your yep, teammates. Yep. And then you didn't want to cry in front of your wife. <laughs> he said, how, that's, how, that's how tough practices were. With, uh, um, so anyway, he, he leaves and he's just like totally into it. Like, you know, into the information. You know, it's not like, well, should I change my form? I just, just tell me how right. to do it. Just yeah. tell me how to do he's it. Eating it up. You know, that's what, you know, in tennis, like in football, there's the brain in the bench. You're doing it this way or you're not playing. Exactly. Tennis kids, like, come on, are you kidding me? <laughs> so he, back in the day, no cell phones. And all of a sudden he, he leaves and then he comes back. And he, he comes back. I just got to tell you one thing. I miss, I go, didn't you have a flight? He goes, yeah, I'll get another one. I missed that one. I just got to tell you this. You got to keep it a secret. So all these years later, I think, I think this, 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 the secret's still safe. Is all, all the years later, he goes, don't tell anybody I have a tennis court. The club I play to is closer to the city. I live out in the suburbs. No one knows I practice all day, every day. <laughs> I don't want anybody to know I'm practicing all day, every day. I need every competitive edge I possibly can. <laughs> so, that's a good one. With, uh, but no, for me to, uh, you know, he actually, I'll tell you two quick stories with uh, meeting Ray Shonky. Um, you know, just stop and think. Uh, Neil Anderson. Um, who was in the Chicago backfield? Um, everybody loved him. He died at such an early age. Uh, Walter Payton. Walter Payton. So he's in the same backfield with Walter Payton. You know your football. That's good. Because that was long before your time. <laughs> so, it was pretty popular, so. Yeah. So uh, Neil Anderson is sent to us by Andy Brandy. And and uh, he comes in and it's just, you know, he's retired. He played at Florida. And Andy was coaching tennis at Florida. Mm -hmm. And uh, he comes and he has a video made. And we have this course that's 25 hours long. He goes back. He wa he's watched the course three times. He came back, you know, then he's, his knees and such, he started playing golf. But right. at that time he was playing tennis. Um, yeah, it's just so fun to talk to people. Like, you know, he talked about Tebow's work ethic. At that time, oh, yeah. Tebow was there. And, um, but I remember Neil Anderson coming to me and, you know, coming back. It was a third visit and he came back and he just smiled and he goes, your system's not going to work. And uh, I just smiling and I said, I know why. Yes, people won't work. <laughs> it won't work because people won't work. It's not my system, but what we've done is some homework and we put systems together. Right. But that's a football story for you. So Shonky is playing for the Dallas Cowboys. He played at SMU. And um, this was captured in a movie 
So Sundays are off, but Sunday's church. And the veterans don't utter one word. The veterans don't say anything <laughs> to the rookies. And um, all the rookies, they stay in bed. You know, the, the veterans all get up and go to church. Right. And the rookies, they, they don't go. And, uh, you know, then they come in and the coaches have baseball bats and they're taking the lids of these aluminum garbage cans and they're making as much noise as they can. Mm -hmm. So the bus has gone off, the people going to church. And in the movie, they show all the veterans. You know, they're fall. They're they're in the they're in the pew behind Tom Landry, but they're all sleeping. <laughs> but they're the rookies. They have two practices, and then they all learn church is not op church is not optional. <laughs> you want to go to church, otherwise you practice it. It's like my my. I went to the same boarding school as my older brother, and uh, so my brother Matt was asked by my great aunt Anna, our great aunt Anna, "Are you still going to church?" And she could scold and laugh at the same time. She had a little Lombardi in her, um, but he's, I remember my brother Matt goes, yeah, I go to St. Pillow and Holy Mattress. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I did touch upon another story with uh, George Allen is that, that was, he played for George Allen and he said he, he when he met somebody, he was going to find out right away, mm -hmm. let me see you do some push-ups. Yeah. Let me see you see some sit-ups. I tell junior tennis players all the time and they really should film each other doing, doing uh, push-ups. Squat, oh, squat, yeah. and then you say, hey, kid, go home, go to YouTube. YouTube can be your enemy, but also it can be a great, mm -hmm. a great friend is watch how to do squat thrusts. Canadians call them burpees. Exactly. Film yourself doing them. You know, we do this. The, the, you can go to YouTube and put in Animal Kingdom and you see these kids doing exercises. Um, you know, the kangaroo is basic, but the frog, the, the, the flamingo, mm -hmm. the spider, the, the, the caterpillar. And, you know, the, a bear walk, you know, duck walk over and over again. Mm -hmm. And they find out right away they're not very good at it. The monkey is a really good one where you have to put your feet down, you throw your legs up in one direction, put your hands down, throw your feet up in the other direction. <laughs> and if you're not very good at it, you got to go to work. Of course. And, and I think that thing's in, in, in football. I mean, you're just, you know, you, you're just called out. You right just, on you're the just, spot. You're just called out. Yeah. And then, like you said, sometimes you're just benched for it, too. You know, in film sessions, I've seen it a lot where, you know, they'll highlight no, number 32. Oh, you missed that block 32. You know what? Actually, you're going to take second team reps this week. Yeah, one of the biggest things about European tennis that's different than American tennis is in Europe, for the most part, and I've been over there many, many times, you know, a lot of, you know, you know like a four-week stint, three to three months, I mean – is that they're playing pickup soccer all the time. Mm -hmm. Is um, with um, why don't we end up with if some uh, comments from you, some quotes? Do you want to go over some more quotes? Any closing uh, comments? Yeah, absolutely. Who doesn't love some quotes, right? Um, I think the one that I had just highlighted. I think character is another word for having perfectly disciplined and educated will. I think say that, that again. Say that again. Character is just another word for having perfectly disciplined. An educated will. All right. So you got to educate your will to be able to master that. And then this, the other one that kind of crescendos on top of that is the good Lord gave you a body that can stand most anything. It's your mind you have to convince. And that's where our will truly comes from. With uh, success demands signals, signalness and purpose. Single-mindedness. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If you can ex if you can accept losing, you can't win. If you can walk, you can run. Confidence is contagious. You said that one. Mm -hmm. Here's, did you say this? Character is just another word for having perfectly disciplined and educated will, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. That's yep. good. There's so many of these. How about the, the measure of who we are is what we do with what we have. Yeah. It sounds like an Arthur Ashe quote. Sure does. Yeah. What we give, what we get, we can make a life. What we give, we can make a living. Isn't that the Arthur Ashe quote? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that when it comes to certainly quotes, uh, said differently and a lot of them are just mind vitamins are just based, mm -hmm. based on common sense. Um, you know, in quotes, I said this earlier, but quotes really don't work unless you do, right? It's, they are just mind vitamins for you to keep going. 
Yeah, some of us will do our jobs well and some will not, but we will be judged by only one thing, the result. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's so many coaches to, uh, to talk about as well. I mean, and I do think in tennis, we lack leadership. Young, young coaches in America, they're leading tennis. Um, that's one thing we're trying to do with a great base is carry the torch from tennis teachers. They've gone from the, from the past tennis teachers that, uh, should not be forgotten. Their work should not be forgotten, especially, mm -hmm. you know, science and logic, but it, uh, like Bill Belichick, he's got, I guess he's got one, one sign up, do your job. Yep. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> you know, people have said about Bill Belichick, you don't like to, uh, interview his players, they all have the same answer. We just need to make plays. We exactly. just, just need to make plays. Yeah, and if you watch his press conferences, I mean, he's straight and to the point. You know, he's no nonsense about it all. Yeah. Lou Holtz is one of my favorites. I had a chance just to talk to him a little bit. We were a friend of mine, Luke Wickham. Hey, Lou Holtz is over there. He's he having dinner by himself. And I said, hey, we'll wait. We don't want to interrupt him as soon as he's done. And uh, I went up to him. He said, sir, you have a minute? Yeah. I said, you know, I know more about Lou Holtz than Lou Holtz. <laughs> and uh, he started laughing. And I said, I just started rattling off Lou Holtz uh, quotes. Um, you know, when, what's important now? What's wow. important now? Um, years ago, and people say, well, Lombardi couldn't coach today. And I said, that's why I think it's important for us to have a podcast on Lombardi. Mm -hmm. Lou Holtz. Uh, years ago, kids would ask, what are my responsibilities and my obligations? Now they want to know what are my rights and privileges? Exactly. It's totally and, changed. Yeah. The tail's wagging the dog. Um, the, um, the Bobby Knight, you know, the parenting, the level of parenting has gone down. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I think parents get offended when, when they hear that, but if, if it's not addressed to like this mom or this dad or this combination of mom and dads, it's, it's really society. Yeah. Yep. And you know, we're, we're at fault too. the triangle junior tennis players with, with, with the parents and coaches as the coaches, um, you know, I think really you just got to look in the mirror and, you know, what can anybody and everybody do to make tennis better? Yeah. Um, you know, what are you doing that's going to, you know, help the game? And, and, uh, I think it's always, you know, doing the extra mind vitamins, you know, it's, uh, not doing the extraordinary, it's just doing the ordinary and extraordinary amount of time. And, yeah. um, with, um, but I, I hope for our listeners, um, the, um, you know, this was, uh, something that they could think about, digest and find some pearls. We always say nuggets mm -hmm. for the tennis treasure chest that, that could help, you know, I think the coaches could help, help them help their players. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think the, the, the best way to lead is by following. And I think you, you first have to be a, a follower before you can be a truly good leader. And, and I think following in the Lombardi's footsteps and the Vic Braden footsteps and the Boletarias, like we're talking about, those are what us young coaches really need to be looking for to continue that leadership in tennis. Yeah. All right. Green Bay, you're going to sure. tell us how Green Bay is going to do this year. Super Bowl. Super Bowl. Going to win it all. Going to win it all. <laughs> and who's taking Aaron Rodgers' place? Uh, Jordan Love. In love we trust. In love we in trust. In love we trust. With uh, coaching? Who's the coach? Matt LaFleur. He's the head coach. What's his background? Um, he's from the uh, Kyle Shanahan tree. So if you know Kyle Shanahan, he's the son of Mike Shanahan. So he's kind of come from that way. Sean McVay was also in that kind of coaching tree as well. So he actually coached for the Redskins there for a little bit as well. Or the, now the football team, um, we should say into where that is all that's a full circle and like we were talking about you know coaching trees and how all yeah. those kind of feedback to the best is awesome oh the coaching tree i think that's something too in tennis um great base means solid fundamentals mm -hmm. and we do have eight pillars but that one course we have tennis intelligence supply we, we mentioned over 100 coaches yeah and um yeah learn baby learn with uh but I think Shanahan, you have, you'd have to go back, go, you know, then who was connected. So it's the son to the yeah. father, but then who did the father? Right. Shanahan, I believe, was in the Bill Walsh coaching tree, if I remember correctly. Um, and then Bill Walsh. Yeah, I don't remember the coaching tree Bill Walsh has, but there's a lot of coaches from the Bill Walsh tree that are still today. And yeah, so Matt LaFleur is just continuing that on. Bill Parcells might have been the best uh, 
as far as trash talking, he might have been the best. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He he was like Lombardi. He could he could kill you with kindness kind of thing. But still, you know, get you fired up with it. Yeah, my looking at with Lombardi, um, Bill Parcells, I, I mean, there's some connection going way back where Parcells um, was coached by someone who was coached by Lombardi. Um, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, excuse me, he had one of the, he had one of the same coaches, whether it was a high school coach or one of the college coaches. There was a connection there, but right. I think that's where um, um, you know, really, you know, with for us, I uh, would like to say when Vic Braden passed away. Um, I mean, I could tell, in a, a, you know, they say New York minutes, uh, New York second. Mm -hmm. you know, people said many, many nice things, but they, they say, yeah, I really knew Braden. And then they'd say a couple more things and you just knew that you really didn't know, they really <laughs> yeah. didn't know Braden. There, there's like so many details to it, so many different levels of understanding. Uh, with, um, like say Vic with a continental grip on the forehand volley, you know, you can volley with any grip you want. You, mm -hmm. you want to shoot out your armpit, you can, but he would talk about the racket face. Um, you know, so if you have a continental grip, okay, fine. But you know, what do you got to do with your elbow? What do you got to do with your wrist? But, yep. you know, the racket face, you know, the moment of truth, how's that racket face at the impact point? Um, you know, one thing I guess I could end with is Jerry Kramer. And I think this is important said, you know, so much is written about Lombardi, but the people really, you know, certainly there's family and friends, but the people really only knew Lombardi, Lombardi as a coach were the people who were coached by Lombardi. Exactly. Exactly. You know? Yeah. You can't, you can't um, substitute that. Yeah. You got to be in the room. Yeah. All right. Ethan Matthews. Great to have you on our podcast. 164 in the books. We'll have to do it again. Football. Absolutely. Love yeah. it, coach. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Yvonne. Thank you as well. What you're doing back there. Yeah, the good looking Appreciate guy, you. the good looking guys behind the camera. Yeah, we, we got that down. We got to put a camera over there for, for him to have. Goodbye to the camera, everyone. Thank you very much. Have a good Get day. better. That's what it's about.